Thank you, ma'am. Okay, we're going to call the school board workshop to order. The purpose is to re. Uh, I got the wrong thing. We are you not going to. Yeah. <laughs> we are not going to do the budget overview. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Purpose and discuss the trauma and trust based relationship intervention program. Roll call of members Mr. Durrance, Mrs. Radonsky, Mr. Martin, Mrs. Shute, myself, the chair, Mrs. Howerton, Superintendent Dr. Longshore, School Board Secretary Mrs. Wellborn, and Amberly and Marissa, and various administration and guests. So I'm going to, am I turning this over to you? Sure. I don't know who I'm. I'm so thankful for the ladies that are here today. Um, this is something that has been, they've been moving forward across our county and working in a lot of different entities to bring an awareness about the issue that they'll be talking about today, the topic that they'll be talking about today. I know that they have also been in some of our schools, doing some work in our schools, and uh, have had rave reviews from um, our educators just becoming more aware of this topic. So we're just so thankful that you're here today and can't wait to dive in, and uh, thank you. Thank you for being very flexible. We were trying to get this date on the calendar, and they moved things around to be able to be here today. So uh, I'm just very thankful for you and look forward to hearing all that you have to present today. So take it away. Awesome. Do we have to hold this, or will we? the sound will pick up without us as long as holding them? If you move, you got to take it with you. If we move, we'll take it with us. We can yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. But Fair it enough. comes out of the holder, you know. Yeah. We it don't does. take the whole yeah, yeah. We're going to have to move. <laughs> We're going to have to move. Well, I move all the time. So <laughs> that's why I can relate to children a lot. <laughs> well, you guys, we are thrilled to be here today. I'm Marissa Stam, Amberly Rogers. And um, we have just launched an initiative here in Highlands County, specific to Highlands County, called Worthy and Known Family Project. And so what we have the privilege of sharing with you guys today is this three hour trauma and TBRI overview um, that we've been able to share across the county. We've, we've done this for over 500 people mm -hmm. um, so far across our county. Um, we've been really excited and, and again honored to be able to have the opportunity to do it. And so today we're going we're gonna to dive in the way that our day is going to look is we're going to start this morning um, understanding first what trauma is, um, the effect that trauma has on the body, the brain, and our community. And then once we know about that, then we're going to talk about what we can do about it. And trust-based relational intervention, or TBRI, is the now what. But we start with trauma so that everybody, we're all using the same language and we're, we're understanding things from the same lens. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> Bear with me because I'm using somebody else's computer. <laughs> so. But I'm in good hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, tech team? Okay. Uh, so anything you want to share before we well, dive in? Well, just, just to give you a little background, because usually when we present, we do give a little background as to why we are in the space that we're in right now. Um, so I have three biological children that all came, um, that graduated from Sebring High School. And when my oldest started there, I volunteered, which led to a job. And I was uh, thankful to be there. And I worked under a fantastic administrator. Mm -hmm and just grew and grew and then, but what it did for me is it really taught me and gave me an idea of what's going on with kids outside of my children and their friends, which wasn't, um, you know, I had not really gone too far out of my comfort zone, I guess. And so it really got me uncomfortable, which was really a good thing because it showed me, um, it, it gave me a lot of passion as to where I want to go next with once my kids were raised. And it led me to um, uh, be part of a child's life that's in foster care, um, which led me, my husband and I, to take Marissa's class, TBRI class, so we could get a little more informed and we could be better equipped to help kids. And um, I just, this was all the things that I did in my classroom without knowing um, that it was TBRI. And what it really taught me is um, how to have better relationships with my peers. And I know this is a, a class and a, a program uh, originally designed to help students and kids, but what it did for me, and I think what it has done for other people that have taken it with me, that um, it has really helped them with their peers. And so, because I think 
trauma, nobody escapes any, you know, trauma or bad things. We all have that. And I, and I think when we have a better understanding of the people that we're talking to and dealing with, and we can look at them with different lenses, um, you know, we're a kinder and more uh, giving society, uh, community. So that's why I'm here where I'm at. And I've been leading a ministry that operates in Ethiopia, actually since 2014. And we work with children who have been orphaned or abandoned, as well as families that are at risk of breaking apart. And we brought TBRI and some of the other programs that we'll be using at um, Worthy and Known Family Project into Salamta Family Project over in Ethiopia several years ago. And the outcomes that we've seen um, in the work that we do over there are absolutely extraordinary. And so our family started walking through foster care when we, in 2019. And as we were walking through foster care, what we realized is that the way that we're wrapping around families through Salamta Family Project in Ethiopia was missing from our system of care here. And so it became abundantly clear that we had been moved here to Highlands County back in 2013 before I even stepped into leadership of Salamta and that it was apparent that it was time to bring what we knew to be true about effectively wrapping around children and families in Ethiopia and bring it here to Highlands County. And then, as God does, he brought Amberly and I <laughs> together, and here we are standing in front of you guys today. Um, so just a little bit about us so that you understand that we're not just, you know, making it up, flying by the seat of our pants, but um, <laughs> we are both TBRI practitioners, and we are both facilitators of another program called Making Sense of Your Worth and Parenting for Positive Self-Worth. Well, we're going to dive right in. Um, to you guys that just walked in, we want to make sure you have all the info. Feel free. There's a couple more chairs up here if you want to sit at a table. It'll be a little easier. Um, but wherever you want to be, <coughs> it works too. Do we have a couple more? Uh, awesome. So we want to frame today kind of talking about these three pillars of trauma-wise care. Um, I know trauma is a big word right now, right? It's kind of one of those hot button words that's being used. And I... I hate that it's that because it should not be a hot button word. It's a reality um, for almost all of us um, that all of us have gone through something that's very difficult, whether it's in our childhood or as we've grown. And, and trauma can really change the trajectory of our development. It can change the trajectory of our belief systems. Um, it can really change the way that we operate. And so there are three pillars that we want to focus on that are really focused in on what it means to be trauma-wise. And the first is felt safety. The second is connection. And the third is self-regulation, okay? Um, if we don't have felt safety in a situation, it will change the way that we think and the way that we believe. Um, if we don't have connection with others, okay, we will not feel seen, heard, and valued. That will also change the way we think and the way that we believe. Um, and if we don't have felt safety or connection, our ability to self-regulate goes out the window. So all of these three things combine together, and we're going to take a look at, as we dive into TBRI, after we go through some of our videos today, um, how this all comes together and plays out so that we can build a really strong foundation for families in Highlands County. Sound good? Okay. And so before we get started, um, we're, we're not going to make you write, read, you know, write a bunch of stuff, but if you'll write down two things for me and for Marissa before you start is, I want you guys to walk away with today with two things, and that are, this is what is so, so important to us, because this is going to change. This is going to, where the change starts. The first thing is, I want you to, to start looking at people with this question, what happened to you? Instead of saying, what's wrong with you? Because I can tell you, unfortunately, and I'm just going to admit, when I worked at Sebring High School, I had kids in my office, they were sad, things were bad, they were upset, they had some stuff going on, and when the parent would come, or the caregiver would come to pick them up, in my head, I didn't say it out loud, Brenda, but in my head, I would think, what is wrong with this parent? Why are they doing what they're supposed to do? And if, if I had known then what I know now, and this is where I really think it's so important for us to start looking at people with the question, what happened to you? Because it changes. See how much softer that is? What happened to you? Not excusing the behavior, but understanding it. And then the other thing, the other question is? The other question is, what's the need behind the behavior? What's the need behind the behavior? We see the behaviors. 
They are apparent, they are frustrating, they are annoying, and we keep playing whack-a-mole with the behaviors, right? Because we want them to go away. And so we try to, to whack them down with compliance, we try to whack them down with structure, we try to whack them down with expectations, right? But if we haven't met the need that is driving that behavior, that behavior will not go away. It might take a different form, but it will not go away. And so we're gonna dig in today, how do we meet the need behind the behavior? But we have to be willing to ask those two questions first. When I, uh, when I say, what's wrong with that guy? It's about me, right? I'm annoyed. What's wrong with that guy? That person has bothered me. But when I ask that question of what happened to you, it shifts it completely. So if we're combining those two questions of what happened to you? And then we're really pausing for a second saying, okay, What's the need behind this behavior? What's driving this? Then we can deal with that. And when we deal with that, the behaviors go away because the need's no longer there. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, on each of your tables, there is a baseline survey. We're gonna ask you to just pull out your phone really quick while I queue up the video. And if you would just start with this baseline survey, we will ask you to do a feedback survey at the end. Please don't let me forget. Sometimes I get so excited to wrap up that I forget that part, and it's the most important. Um, as you can see, we want to be able to track quantitative and qualitative data so that we can really prove um, what we're stepping into is effective, but it starts with the baseline survey. So if you guys would take that really quick, that would be awesome. And I will cue this up. We are going to watch about 22 minutes of a, a documentary called Resilience. And it just sets us up with a really good understanding of what trauma is. It's going to give you a little bit of history on um, what we call adverse childhood experiences and the ACEs study that was done. Um, it'll give us just a good foundation to be able to speak from going forward. Everybody up for that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to start it while you guys finish that. to think of childhood as this time of joy and innocence. But I mean, for many of us, it's just not true. We just pretend all those things don't happen. Our investment in the denial is so high. Ah, you know, the kids are young, they're very resilient, they don't know what's going on, they won't remember anyway. Well, the child may not remember, but the body remembers. This is the biggest public health discovery we've ever seen. It blew my mind, just blew my mind. We didn't know that all of these kind of problems have a common cause. There was this incredible gene whiz effect. You mean adverse childhood experiences cause heart disease and lung disease and liver and cancer? The impact is on your behavior. It's on your learning, it's on your heart, it's on your DNA. Like, how do you, how do you deal with all that stuff? The biggest problem that we need to avoid is people not wanting to talk about it, or people not wanting to address it. We have a whole new body of knowledge now that could open up new ways of thinking about what we have up till now been seen as intractable and solvable problems. And if you can weave the science through these different sectors and get it into the hands of the general population, they will invent very wise actions. It's there. It's there. It's possible. And a defeatist kind of attitude or a sense of futility is completely disconnected from what 21st century science is telling us. And we should be going after them like a bear.
my strongest belief, especially as a person that's been working in public health now for more than 25 years, is this information needs to get to everyone, not just us. Not just the smart people like us, right? <laughs> Back in the 1980s, I became interested in the emotional underpinnings of disease and behaviors. How things like depression might affect the incidence of cardiovascular disease. Back then, it was really controversial, and people actually laughed at us for, for getting into that kind of work and say, well, you're, Rob, what, do you, what does this have to do with public health or medicine? And it's saying, well, you're nuts. The key message that we have learned is that a totally different kind of history taking needs to be done. My colleagues assured me that I was crazy to think about doing this. What one finds from this is, is quite important. Vince Folletti and I, we didn't know it, but we were working in parallel fields. And I started routinely inquiring about childhood sexual activity and was, was really overwhelmed because it seemed that every other person I was asking was providing me a history of childhood sexual abuse. And I vividly remember thinking, I mean, you know, I mean, this can't be true. People would know. Somebody would have told me. I mean, wasn't, wasn't that what medical school was for? I didn't blame myself for not saying anything. I should have said something. But then again, I mean, I was, I had no one really to tell that I would trust. Weight gain, most commonly. A good friend of mine at the CDC who was studying obesity met Vince. He commented to me, look, you know, if what you're saying is true, it's got an enormous importance for the country and for the practice of medicine, but nobody's going to believe your 286 cases, no matter how well you've studied them. He said, you need to talk to my friend Rob, who's looking at some of these emotional and psychiatric underpinnings of disease. What we need is a large epidemiologically sound study with thousands of people in it. Let's pull this all together and show the big picture. A study of over 17,000 middle-class adults here at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego. It was a well-educated group of people, most have been to college. In no way could you dismiss this as, well, you know, I don't see people like that in my practice, et cetera, you know, that's them across town. There are questions like, were your parents ever separated or divorced? Did your parents ever swear at you, insult, or put you down, or hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? We ran into serious opposition. Touch or fondle your body in a sexual Was way. Was anyone in your household depressed or mentally ill, or your parents were too drunk or high to take care of your family? You can't ask patients questions like that. Did your father ever repeatedly hit your mother over at least a few minutes? Or you didn't have enough to eat? You're going to cause people to decompensate. You may make occasional people suicidal. Did anyone in your household ever go to prison? As though it were generally agreed that repression is the best approach to life's traumas, certainly the most comfortable for other people. So the first thing that we found is that adverse childhood experiences are common. 28% had been physically abused. 27% grew up with substance abuse in their homes. 13% witnessed their mothers being physically abused. One in five had been sexually abused. 
I was the first person to see this data. Wow. I was in my study. I had the software on my computer. I saw this, and I wept. I had no idea how much adversity and abuse and neglect and violence there was in our culture. There were 10 types of adversity. We added them up. So the first thing I looked at was smoking and saw that as the count of categories of bases went up, the percentage of people that smoked went up, and I was astonished. I'd never seen something like that before. And then I started looking at all the other things like alcohol abuse and depression and teenage pregnancy and heart disease and saw that as the score went up, all of these major public health problems that we collected as part of the survey went up in a stepwise fashion. You know, when you think you read the latest cancer scare of the week in the newspaper, you know, something increases the likelihood of, bre of breast cancer, prostate cancer by 30%. Everybody's all upset about this, and here we're talking about thousands of percent. said, Rob, this can't be true. Because if this were really true, somebody would have already known about it and would have been studied and published. So there must be something wrong with the way you did the study. So we had to go back and recheck everything we'd done. And of course, it was all correct. And at that point, it was clear to me that this was real, um, but that nobody wanted to know about it. what's crazy. Should I start with your head or with your toes? With your ears, okay, all right, let me take a look. When you look at adverse childhood experiences, they're actually a stronger predictor of risk of ischemic heart disease than any of the traditional risk factors. When you think about uh, high blood pressure, uh, uh, high cholesterol, or even smoking. Say, ah, ah, that's great, and yet, I was never trained on this in one day in medical school. For the ACE study, done in a community that is upper middle class, primarily Caucasian, when I looked at those health outcomes, immediately the question that came to my mind was, what does that mean for my kids in the community that I serve? to San Francisco when I finished my residency in 2005, you looked at the Bayview Hunters Point neighborhood of San Francisco versus the Marina District or Pack Heights. If you're a child born in Bayview Hunters Point, your life expectancy is 11 years shorter if you're born in Bayview versus if you're born on the other side of town. I kept on asking a question, why is it that we're seeing this in these communities? Here in the Bayview, gun violence has killed four people just this month alone. It's the highest rate of uh, homicides in the city of San Francisco. And it also has the highest rate of ambulatory care hospitalizations at any neighborhood in the city. Heart disease, diabetes, you know, all of the above. Two deadly shootings in the Bayview District of San Francisco. They happened late this afternoon, just minutes apart. The first shooting, 424. There were some things that you were struggling with. And I think one of the things was his asthma management, but the other, some of the things was, was school. Like, we, we were not in that place with school. 
he was having a difficult time, right along with a lot of other kids there, having a difficult time switching over from a normal routine to being scared to going back to a normal routine. It was very difficult. A lot of families said violence is a really big issue in our community. We need mental health services to help to deal with that. And do you know people, do you know kids who have died? My friend, Rashawn, just died a couple weeks ago. Last week, somebody stabbed him. Part of the game right up there. For a while, I They came in for a regular physical, but he's been acting out in school. Mm -hmm. Auntie feel, seems overwhelmed and feels like she needs tools. We had hired a psychologist who was also on site seeing families with me at the clinic. One day he came into my office and he said, have you seen this? And he handed me the ACES study by Felidia and Anda. And honestly, I, it was like I was hit by a bolt of lightning. <laughs> it was a total validation of what I was seeing in the kids that I was treating. Being in a community where you're hearing gunshots on the daily, where you are having friends who are being killed or being incarcerated, that really aff affects your body, right? Like it, it gets under your skin. We got the immunization rate up. We had nutritional counseling. So we were getting great health outcomes. But one of the big challenges that we found was that families were saying, Dr. Burke, please, can you help Bobby? Yes. Come on, Bobby. You got to see Bobby. Bobby's falling out in class. He's hitting the kid next to him. He can't pay attention. He's running out of class. Please, Dr. Burke, you've got ADHD. Can you please put him on some Ritalin? And when I did a thorough history and physical, which is my job, it turned out that I couldn't make a diagnosis of ADHD, which is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, because a lot of the kids I was seeing were dealing, had so many traumatic experiences in their life. Okay. Hey, now, if you take a kid who's been exposed to trauma, they also will have difficulty with impulse control, difficulty with regulating their behavior. The big difference is, if you give a child with an overactive stress response, a stimulant, what do you think is gonna happen? It's not gonna help. And so I think people were seeing the behavior, but we're not getting to the root of what is causing the behavior. But there's actually something functionally changing in their brain. And it's interesting how much activity overall they have when processing all types of emotions, happy, sad, fearful, angry. We tend to divide uh, the world of mental health separate from the world of physical health, but the body doesn't do that. <laughs> the body's only one. Stressful or traumatic things can affect the health of kids. And so one of the things that we do here is that we screen all of our patients for uh, what we call adverse childhood experiences or these kind of stressful experiences in childhood. We don't need to know which ones. We only need to know how many. It's intense and getting folks to open up and all that stuff is very difficult. But here's the thing about it. It may have occurred in your family. We found that for kids at the Baby Child Health Center, if they had an ACE score four or more, they were 32 times as likely to have learning and behavior problems in school. 32 times as likely, right? than if you had an ACE score of zero. The reality is that we all need a certain amount of stress, a certain amount of anxiety to perform well. If we don't care about that exam that we're gonna have tomorrow, we'll probably fail. If we're gonna cross the street and if traffic is coming at us, we have release of adrenaline. We have release of a hormone that we call cortisol. We want to jump out of there, and adrenaline and cortisol are going to help us do that. So there's that good amount of stress. But if all day long you're feeling like a truck is coming at you, day after day after day, that's going to take a toll on the body. And the amygdala obviously here is 
has greater activation yes. in the PTSD. We were able to image children that had experienced trauma and compare those brain images with children that didn't have an experience of trauma, didn't have symptoms. Right, an exaggerated fear response. An exaggerated fear response. With decreased activation in areas that we need to control that emotion in the frontal areas. Exposure to early adversity and trauma literally affects the structure and function of children's developing brains. So the kid next to them hits them or the teacher reprimands them in a way that uh, they're uncomfortable with, right? Literally what they're feeling, that activation is like there was a truck coming at them. You can give something that will mask symptoms, right? For example, if someone has a cough, right? You can give them a really strong cough serum that will suppress their cough. But if it's because they have tuberculosis or lung cancer, then what you're doing is merely masking the symptoms while the disease process continues to fester. We know what's happening in children's brains and bodies with the experience of toxic stress. So the question now is, what do we do about it? You know, if I had to boil this down to one thing for people to learn from this science, um, it's to totally put to bed forever the sense that children who are born under disadvantaged circumstances are doomed to poor life outcomes. The science is saying um, that's just not true. You know, we're all soulmates on this side. <laughs> right? So there is a part of the world that, that really is invested in studying development, right? And then there's another part of the world that is on the issues. Although there are huge political differences and how people feel about where the money should go, um, there are very few people who don't want to see good things happen for kids. So, but I think pediatricians naturally come to uh, the need to be able to explain things to people. This one here is the videos over the last three years. Wow. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the science amazing. doesn't speak for itself. It's not like you can take the scientific paper and publish it in the local newspaper and have people understand it. So we coined the term toxic stress and started to try to explain to people how, you know, there's, there's stress and there's stress. So, oh God, let's, um, it's, it's time to kind of look at the camera again and see. Unfortunately, over the years, a lot of people have misused the term. You just talk to a friend and say, oh, say, how are you doing? Say, oh, I've had a terrible day. I'm experiencing such toxic stress. And I say, well, do you, have, do you have anybody to turn to? Do you have any friends to talk to? Do you have any support? Oh, yeah, I've got plenty of support. You're not experiencing toxic stress. <laughs> Because toxic stress is this chronic activation of stress systems with no buffering protection, no support. We don't say to the people who got cancer, why don't you suck it up and be like the person who didn't get cancer? Right? But when we see this as a result, when we see it in, in problems in school or problems in behavior, we say to people, why don't you suck it up? and, you know, be like that other guy who's doing well in school and who's not doing drugs. This is a real problem in terms of public understanding because we are so captivated by the self-made person. We are so captivated by the rugged individual. We are so caught up in this sense of pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get over it. But the problem is when you're very young, when you're a baby, when you're a toddler, you can't pull yourself up by your booty straps. Everybody likes to talk about resilience. It's like, uh, what's resilience? And the one thing we know about it, from a science point of view is it's not something, it's something you're born with. It's something that gets built over time. Can you learn how to deal with conflict constructively when you grow up hearing your parents screaming at each other every other night? 
you learn how to focus your attention when you live in a neighborhood where you hear gunshots and sirens? Can you control your impulses? You never know whether your father with a drinking problem is going to strike out in a rage. Can you delay gratification when all your friends around you are doing drugs? Can you plan for the future when it's hard to get through even a single day? What stood out to you? I know it's a lot. It can be a little heavy. So we definitely want to say something really quick. Where there's breath, there's hope. And we'll say that throughout the whole training. And we know this is heavy. And when we do it with teachers, especially, we want to say constantly, where there's breath, there's hope. So just know that. And we've got a lot of hope. We've got a lot of people loving on kids. And we don't want you to just think about kids. Right. OK? We want you to also think about our administrators, our school staff, because if they don't, if they aren't able to stand on those three pillars of felt safety, connection, and self-regulation, it certainly can't cascade down from them to the kids. What stood out to you? couple of things. <laughs> um, living in the classroom for so long, we have a ton of kids that this, that is, you know, their life. And if they have a trusting adult, they will talk to, you know, teachers. So then our teachers are hearing those things. And I like that you guys said, you know, it's not just our kids, it's our teachers too, because then our teachers, they, they take on that you know, that weight of, of the kids. Um, so that's big, but I also, you know, since it's been building for a while, but I think COVID kind of, you know, Exacerated it, it blew everything, everything up. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I think we've been expecting our teachers to just go on and pull yourselves back together and, you know, put on, yeah. put on your, you know, Pull up those bootstraps and just get going and act like nothing's wrong and let's just go to it. And, um, you know, our, our teachers are dealing with some trauma, but then they're also being expected to support our kids. Right. And how can they support our kids if they're not getting the support they need and we're not helping them through what they've got to? Absolutely. And we all bring, we bring our own things to the table all the time. Right. And I love in the video where um, one of the doctors says as if repression is the solution to our trauma. Well, it's certainly more comfortable for other people. Right. We can't repress it away. It doesn't go away. So if all we've done is repress it, we've just pushed it down harder, deep into the things that keep us stuck. And at some point it will come out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It will come out in behaviors. Without a doubt, whether you are 45, 25, or 15. What else stood out to you guys? Like when COVID and the COVID shutdown, um, we went from schools being a safe place for students to immersing them into a lot of the environments that cause all these issues. So they were just almost locked into that environment. So they stayed there 24 seven. And then when they came back in the schools, it's hard to undo some of the things that were done because the house is the place where the issues are, are occurring. You know, so schools are a safe place a lot of times for these students to, to come and they feel comfortable with us. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, yeah. We, um, well, I know like reports of child abuse and things like that definitely significantly, significantly went down during COVID because our teachers are a lot of the reporters and eyes and ears for our students. And we have to, I think it's very easy to sometimes for us to want to blame parents, right? Um, but we've got to understand and love parents too. And that's not necessarily every teacher's job, right? Because <laughs> but, they don't need another job. <laughs> uh, but I think as a community, we have to be able to love the families of our community well and ask the question of what happened to you? 
What's the need behind the behavior, right? Because when we don't do that and we are judging what we're seeing and we're not in their home, we're not in their shoes, right? When we're judging it, um, we're not helping that child. And so with Worthy and Known, one of our goals is to be able to wrap around families, to be able to bring some of these tools to the families because we know the schools can't do it all. Right? I think too often we keep heaping things onto our schools and expecting our schools and our teachers to do what we as a community have been charged to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Molly? Anything else? Just, um, I remember my daughter telling me one year she had a student that she just felt she could not reach that student and there was a trust, you know, that he was dealing with and trusting and, you know, anyone. But at the she said she just kept trying to reach out. And at the end of the year, she said the last day of school, he walked by her desk and threw his picture on, on her desk. And that made her realize, you know, I did, you know, he she reached out. So it's just, it is amazing. I mean, what these kids are going through and trying to gain that trust of someone they can trust, you know. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. And in your book, in your packet, if you guys would look in the front pocket really quick, there are two things that we want to share with you. Amberly's going to share um, the so hand model is, of the brain. If you guys want to pull this out, we'll, we'll do this together. It's kind, of, it can, it's kind of fun. So if you'll, you can pick a hand, either your right or left, whatever you feel comfortable with. But this is, this is your brain. <laughs> um, but in utero, the first thing that develops, your wrist is going to be your stem, right, where your spinal cord develops, okay? And then your thumb, if you'll do this, is your amygdala. That's the organ in the center of your brain. If you're familiar with like brain work, that's what they would call downstairs brain. But this is your amygdala. This is your limbic system. This is where um, stress happens. Cortisol is pumped through here. Adrenaline pumps through here. This is a good thing. The amygdala can be a very good thing. It can also be a very stressful thing if it's constantly engaged. If you're feeling this is your fight, flight, or freeze. So you guys have all heard that, I know. This is the one where they send the video. If you're walking across the street, your car comes, it tells you to get out of the way. You know, this is the one that Marissa and I met on Friday and said, we're, we're, we're getting ready for the school board and we're gonna do it well, <laughs> right? So we did, but we had each other. And so it wasn't, it wasn't overstressed, right? But this is um, the fight, flight, or freeze. So this is the one that tells you all the time to get out of the way, stop, um, or fight, okay? And then your fingers, are your frontal cortex. This is the, the upstairs brain, the front part of your brain. This is where logic, language, and reason happen. And when you're a person um, that uh, feels stress and your amygdala is engaged, you have no, you cannot access your logic, language, and reason. It's very hard to access. And if you're a person that has, is under stress and is like this, then the other person in the room has maybe two or three words that they're gonna hear because their amygdala is engaged and their fight, flight, or freeze, and there's no logic, language, and reason. So when I was in the classroom and a student came in, I was under this crazy impression that if I was nice, they would be nice to me. They didn't feel safe with me, they didn't know me, they had no reason to trust me, but I just assumed that if I stood at the door with the peppermint and smiled at them, they'd be like, oh, Mrs. Robert, <laughs> but I had to earn their trust. I had to make them feel safe. And so lots of times they were coming to me like this. So when they came to me and I said something and it triggered them and they got into the fight, flight, or freeze mode and they said something super nasty back, how helpful do you think it would have been? Because that triggers me, right? You don't want to be told, you don't want to be talked to in an ugly way. How helpful do you think it would have been if both I was triggered and this child was triggered? Or when I called a parent and I said, hey, I just wanna let you know that, yeah, well tell me something I don't know. Or when a teacher came in my office and gave me a referral and said, this student is, you know, a lot of trouble, there's a lot of things, da, 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 and the teacher was aggravated, 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 I wish so bad I had known some of this stuff because that triggered me. I just wanted the teacher to do what they were supposed to do and be nice and stop doing referrals. But they wanted that child to cooperate and their job was to teach that child. And why, didn't I, why couldn't I have looked at that teacher and said, wait, I'll be the regulator in the room because this is where we all want to be, under regulation, where we have logic, language, and reason. 
our amygdala is not pumping strong. It's not super lit up. We want to be regulated. So why couldn't I have been the regulator and look at that teacher and say, wait, how can I help you? Instead of being mad at me. Because it's frustrating when you're trying to deal with people and you're like this. So this whole brain model thing, we do this at, like at my house, kind of a joking thing. I know a lot of you know my husband, Jason, but he'll, I'll be saying something, he'll be like, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then I have to get my, I mean, you know, we, we joke about it, but the truth is, this is a very mindful thing to always try to, try to stay regulated so I can be logic, language, and reason, so I can speak to people with those three things. So I'm not mean, so I can give kindness, so I can give care. And when I do get like this, I have lots of co-regulators, and I, I needed them when I was five, and I need them when I'm 50. Marissa, help me out. Jason, help me out. Carolyn, help me out. Like, you know, we all, I have a big community of people that will help me get to a place of regulation. So our job, either fortunately or unfortunately, I like to say fortunately, is to be that person of regulation, but we had such, such hard work and such mindfulness for the people that we come in contact with. Yeah, yeah. And as, you know, as the adults in the room, um, as a, especially like when we're th thinking about our schools, someone who's dysregulated can't bring another person who's dysregulated to a place of regulation. Yeah. So as the adult in the room, as the leader, as I have to be regulated first, and I have to know how to get there. I have to have the tools to know how to get there, and then I have to know how to co-regulate this other person to help them get back to a place of regulation so we can keep moving the train forward. Because if we're both here, we're going nowhere. Mm -hmm. We're going nowhere. Uh, this hand model of the brain comes from Dr. Dan Siegel um, and his book, The Whole Brain Child. And this is all about brain de development from zero to 12. Okay. Um, so what we just shared with you actually comes from Dan Siegel. And also in your packet is just a quick handout of adverse childhood experiences. We totally lifted this off the internet. We didn't make it. <laughs> uh, it's not specific to the film Resilience, but we just wanted it to be a reminder of the impact of ACEs. Um, one that isn't on here that I want you guys to please write down <laughs> is that a child who has had four or more adverse childhood experiences is 32 times more likely to have learning and behavior problems in a classroom. 32 times more likely. So I want to challenge, I want us to begin to be challenged by this notion of is it willful disobedience or is this survival behavior? So a child who has four or more ACEs is 32 times more likely to have learning and behavior challenges in a classroom. We have to start thinking about behavior differently. Behavior is telling us something. But we have to be willing to ask those two questions that Amberly posed in the beginning. What happened to you? And what's the need behind the behavior? We want you guys to be able to actually see the ACES quiz. And so in the back pocket of your book, you have one. So this is the ACES quiz. And there's a yellow sticky on it. And every time we do this training, we ask everybody in the room to Read through this and find your number. What's your ACEs score? And if you're willing, we just ask you to write it on this yellow sticky, fold it in half, and really will come by and pick them up. Okay? We have surveyed so far. Over 500 people in our community. 541 to be exact. In the original ACEs study, 33% of the people surveyed did not have an adverse childhood experience. So that means 67% of the people surveyed had one or more, right? In the original ACEs study that was done with 17,000 people out in San Diego. Our community so far, with 541 surveyed, has almost 80% of those surveyed have at least one or more adverse childhood experience. 34% of those surveyed so far 
have had four or more. Almost everyone we've surveyed so far has been a professional in the county. Case manager, teacher, somebody affiliated with a local church. Okay? So just to kind of get an understanding of, of where we're coming from and the data that we're collecting. So again, if you guys are willing to, um, these, the, we do not need the sheet. We just need the sticky folded in half with your number. Yeah. That's all we ask for. The right sheet there. is yours to keep. Um, and again, you guys, we, we get that the topic that we're sharing about is heavy. It's heavy, and it can stir stuff up. It can stir stuff up in each of us as we're going through it. It can stir stuff up in the way that we think about the people that we serve. Um, and so we just want you, especially as we continue on today, I want you to be hopeful. Like Amberly said, where there is breath, there is hope. The guy from Harvard said that we are not doomed to these poor life outcomes. And we're going to talk about how we mitigate these. But if we never get to the need behind the behavior, if we never get to the root of the problem, then we, it's just repressed. We just keep pushing it down, and it keeps making us more stuck. And I just want to say to make sure, and I know we've said this, but I will say it several times, um, this training and what we, what we what we are doing isn't to uh, make an excuse for behavior. It's just to understand it. Because when we understand it and where it could be coming from, we can get to the root of it and change it. You know, we don't, you know, detention, I assess sometimes, I mean, all of those things are important tools. And I understand that from being in the school system myself. But if we can get to the root of the behavior and why it's happening, I cannot tell you, and those of you that are teachers, I mean, raise your hand if you've ever had a kid that when they come back to regulation and they're sitting with you and you say, why, you know, like, why did you do that and what happened? I don't know if any of you, but this has happened to me over and over again where a child looks at me and I'm telling you, five-year-old to 18-year-old and says, I have no idea why I did that. And I really, really believe, looking in their eyes, that they really don't know how, why they did that. So I want, and I'm so glad I'm having the tools now to say, what's the need behind the behavior? And let's help you figure out why you're doing it so you'll stop, so you won't repeat it. Um, so anyway, so just so you know, not for excuses, but for understanding and for love. And with uh, trust-based relational intervention, there's no room for bad behavior. There's no room for disrespect. But how we go about dealing with it is, is what it's all about. And so we're going to dig into that shortly, but we have one more quick video to share with you guys. It's about 11 minutes long, and it kind of picks up where the last one left off, okay? So you're going to hear a couple things repeated just real quick, but we're going to step into, um, we're going to go through, we're going to touch on the ACEs, and then we're going to talk briefly about um, something called epigenetics, okay? And then we take a quick break after this, so just so you know, the potty's on, on its way. <laughs> We have all been very effectively taught as children that there are certain things that nice people don't talk about and surely don't ask. What happens at home stays at home. Well, guess what? That is impossible to do because you carry it with you no matter what. Children who had adverse childhood experiences, it could be abuse, it could be neglect, it could be anything with regard to that was detrimental to the child without a buffer. What we see now is, is there's a whole uh, body of research now that's starting to come out. And it's one of the first times that adverse childhood experiences was connected to dying earlier. The A study itself, we had roughly 17 and a half thousand people in the study. And we have thus far been following them forward 19 years in time. A very clearly middle class group. One conclusion is, my God, if things are this bad in the clearly middle class group, you know, they surely are not going to get better if you're living on the street or in prison or part of an oppressed minority. We know that by doing therapy or dealing with some of the issues that cause some of that stress that you can change that and limit the amount of damage that it does to the body. The health-related costs for an individual versus a system are profound. 
And that's just pure cost. That's not, that's a, the cost right then. That's not the cost of a child experiencing those adverse events and the clinical outcome that we know will play a role for that child's health. When you recognize the statistics about how those adverse childhood experiences show up in some of the healthcare issues that we work with and deal with, you recognize pretty quickly uh, that there's work for us to do here in healthcare. Whole People Childhood Trauma is a TPT Partnerships co-production with Centra Care Health. Normal childhood brain development starts right from the get-go. In a, an ultimate and a wonderful situation, you'd have adult caregivers, doesn't have to be parents, but adult caregivers who are bonding with that child and making sure that they're, they're their ongoing source of stimulus and also feeding off of anything that a child is offering. It's that serve and volley approach in which a child is seeking guidance and an adult in some way affirms it. And that lays down the brain connections and sets off a pathway that allows for really kids, adults to function as a relationship-based society. About five years ago, one of my colleagues, one of the chaplains in the spiritual care department came to me and she said, Brett, have you ever heard of the ACE study? And of course, at that point, I hadn't. And so she gave me a lot more information so I could become more aware of the ACE study and the impact of the ACE study. And we sort of decided that this was something that the organization needed to um, be embracing more and so brought it to senior administration and you know, started having conversations about what would it take for us to become a trauma-informed organization. And right now we're in a phase uh, within Central Care that we're just doing a lot of education and information. And so changing that question from um, what's wrong with you to what happened to you. When people have three or more adverse or four more adverse childhood experiences, there is a likelihood that if that is never mediated, which means that there's never any kind of nurturance or ever, never any kind of reprieve from that, what has a tendency to happen is that those people will also experience social and emotional upheaval. They might experience an adoption of high-risk behavior. All these different types of ways to deal with that trauma and those people, what the ACE study says is that those people usually on average die earlier. Although the ACE study was primarily done for white people. Adverse childhood experiences or ACE study is an outgrowth of multiple unexpected counterintuitive observations that we were making starting in about 1984 or 1985 in a major obesity program that I was putting together in my Department of Preventive Medicine at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego. There was one notable patient, uh, a young woman who showed up in 1985. She was 28 years old, who weighed 408 pounds, asked us if we could help her with her problem. And uh, in retrospect, our first mistake was accepting her diagnosis of what the problem was. And so we said yes and entered her into the program and took her from 408 to 132 in 51 weeks. And then in one three-week period, regained 37 pounds, which I had not conceived as being physiologically doable before that. In short order, she's back over 400 pounds, faster than she had lost the weight. And I remember asking her, you know, what's, what's going on? And after some trying to escape the question on her part, led to her telling me about a lengthy incest history with her grandfather from age 10 to age 21. I remember thinking, my, you 
this is the second incest case I've seen in 23 years of practice at that point. I had always assumed it was quite rare. It's actually fairly common. What's rare is for anyone ever to bring it up and, you know, even rarer for anyone to ask. So that was really sort of the opening wedge uh, into coming to realize that childhood sexual abuse was quite common. And ultimately, these things that we were seeing were so unexpected and so prevalent that people at the CDC convinced me that we really needed to look at a very large sample and from a general population to see whether these things that we were finding so commonly in our obesity program existed in the general population, and if so, how did they play out over time? ACEs on a public health level are those items that we really recognize are the things that drive um, and are linked to, to outcomes of poor health. And so those genes that are more likely to be expressed in a toxic environment may be some of the genes that you don't really want translated. Those are gonna be genes in which you might have more anxiety, you might have more cancer, you might be more at risk for hypertension or depression. And so yes, when we talk about the effects of toxic stress on the individual at that family level, and you could see it generation after generation, there's a lot of science behind why that really is the case. The difference in terms of the way that I look at it is that I also believe that poverty is an adverse childhood experience. I believe that uh, historical trauma is an adverse childhood experience. And a generational trauma is an adverse childhood experience. Institutional trauma is an adverse childhood experience. And that couples with people's personal traumas. So a lot of times when we're working with trauma, we're zeroing in on the personal traumas without all of this other stuff that may have proceeded before the child even made it to the earth. There's a study that was done years ago called the Cherry Blossom study. Cherry Blossom was where they took these male mice and they put them in a cage together and they gave them good food, good water, clean water, run around, all that different type of stuff. After a little while, what the scientists did was start pumping in the smell of cherry blossoms. What the mice didn't know is that on the bottom of the cage, it was electrified. So they would pump in the cherry blossom smell and then at the same time, turn on the electricity. And you can imagine that these mice started to try and protect themselves, crawling all over each other, trying to get out of the cage. So they did that over time. What they noticed is that number one, the mice never returned to baseline. Nothing like that happened. The other thing that happened is that when they stopped the electricity and then just pumped in the cherry blossom smell, they did the same thing, you know, conditioning. So they took these male mice, then put them in the cage with female mice who had never had this experience. They bred. And then just before the female mice had baby mice, they removed the fathers. So they never had any contact with each other. Once the mice got of age, they started pumping in the cherry blossom smell. And what happened was, is these mice started doing the same thing that their fathers did. That's the epigenetic, that's the blood-borne memory. Yeah, you know, I think epigenetics is the new, new science, and I... Yeah, and it's this idea of the environment, right? So with the mice, the, the trigger was the smell of the cherry blossom fragrance. So the trigger could be smell in a room, could be a tone of voice, it could be a quick movement, it could be a song, it could be a sound. 
The trigger could be something that we don't really know, right? And the kid doesn't either. But it's his body knows. His body responds because the body keeps the score. The body keeps the score. That's what the ACEs test tells us, right? Is that the body keeps the score. So just um, to give you guys an idea, so I have 13 people in this room and 39% of the people in this room have four or more ACEs. Which is pretty honestly typical when you're working with, when you're in front of people who are working with kids and working with families because our desire to do it is because we want improvement in their lives possibly from things that happen in ours. So it's really typical when you're in the room with mental health counselors and things like that for those scores to be high. Our desire is to, to make it better for the next generation. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? And that's a lot to take in. Where there's breath, there's hope. <laughs> we want to give you guys some peppermints around, so go ahead and do that. But you all take a quick five-minute break. We'll get some hydration, nutrition, and bathroom, and then we'll start back up. But she, yeah, oh, they didn't have that in the
We're back? Yes, we're back. All we're right. Back. We are back. All right. Well, we're glad that we saw everybody kind of get up and move, get something to eat, something to drink. We're going to find out in just a little bit why that is so incredibly important <laughs> for our bodies and our brains. Um, you don't even know that we are TBRI in the room. <laughs> we're very purposeful in, in some of what we're doing today. Um, well, thank you guys for coming back, coming back in the space. Um, as we begin to jump into trust-based relational intervention, we want to start with something that's called the five Bs, okay? And with this iceberg that you see here, right? Think about if you're in the ship on the water, right? All you see is the tip of the iceberg, right? So what do we see? Behavior. behavior. We see behavior, right? We see the behavior. The behavior is frustrating, right? The behavior is confusing. The behavior is dysregulating. Um, it's distracting, right? That's what behavior is. Behavior gets our attention. But what we've got to understand is that behavior is motivated by what's happening inside our biology, our belief system, our bodies, and our brains. Okay? There's so much more going on than just the behavior that we see. And we want the behavior to stop. There's no question. Right? And we play whack-a-mole with those behaviors all the time, with compliance, with punishment, with expectation, right? But if we aren't considering what's happening in the brain, in the body, in the biology, in the belief system of the people, whether it's adults or children that we're working with, we are missing it. And it will sink our ship. It will sink it, OK? Can we all agree that that is true? <laughs> but that is true. And so now that we know a little bit more about trauma, now the question is, okay, what do I do about it? Right? TBRI is the now what? Trust-based relational intervention uh, was developed at Texas Christian University through the Karen Purvis Institute of Child Development. Amber Lee and I are both um, practitioners. We've gone through the full training. Um, to be able to train others, okay? You have to be a practitioner in order to train this. The um, institute gets very angry if it's just <laughs> being done willy-nilly. So that's not an option. Um, and trust-based relational intervention um, was originally developed to work with kids from hard places. It was originally developed for foster and adoptive families who were working with kids that were coming into their homes. But what they've discovered over, over a decade of development of TBRI is that it's really a relationship model. It's a way to be in relationship with other people. And so I want you guys to not only think about TBRI as we talk about it today as it relates to working specifically with children or specifically in the classroom, but I want you to also think about what it looks like to apply it across your life with, with your closest relationships, right? With your spouse, with your best friend, um, with your peers, with other adults in your life, with the families that we serve through the school system, and then also all the way down to the kids, okay? Because remember what, when Amber Lee was doing the hand model earlier, right? Um, if, if we're dysregulated, we can't bring somebody else to a place of regulation. When we are regulated and our full brain is engaged, including our frontal lobe, that's when language, reason, and logic are accessible. But if we're here, or if somebody else in the room is here, language, reason, and logic goes out the window. Okay? So TBRI is going to help us understand what's driving this and how to help ourselves and the people that we're in the room with get back here. Fair enough? Fair enough. All right. OK, so the goals for TBRI anytime we ever train are to, here, here they are, right on the board or the screen, lay foundation for insight, create practical framework for intervention and application, enhance understanding regarding interpreting behavior and responding appropriately. So that is the main goal for TBRI. Yeah. And that's our goal from walking away from today, OK? The packet that you have in front of you that we're opening up is a six-hour training. We are giving you a high-level overview in an hour and a half, OK? The full TBRI caregiver training 
is 24 hours long. It starts with this intro and overview, and then it breaks out the three principles of TBRI. We're going to talk about those in, in a little bit more detail, but it's connecting, empowering, and correcting. Okay? Those are the, the three principles of TBRI, and then each of those principles has strategies underneath them. We'll dig into that in just a minute. Um, but as we walk into these goals today, I want you to understand that you are getting a high-level overview today of what TBRI is and how we can use it well, okay? There's a lot, that we can go a whole lot deeper into the, the practical application and implementation of these principles and strategies. Go for it. Okay, what is TBRI? It's a holistic intervention that has been developed over the past decade. It's an evidence-based practice that meets the needs of the whole person, and it's an approach to caregiving that is developmentally respectful, responsive to trauma, and attached-based. Yeah. And what um, the, the main thing to me about TBRI, which is what I really buy into, is it really is about relationships and connecting. And when we feel, when we have a good relationship with somebody, we feel safe. And when we feel safe, we can be regulated a lot and we're usually in regulation when we feel safe, right? So um, TBRI, it's all these things, but it's really about being in relationship and community with each other. And I, this is, and we were designed to be in community and relationships with one another. So. Yep, um, we were, we were, we were designed specifically to be interdependent on one another. Okay, to be in community with one another. It's the way that, that we thrive. Babies who have been abandoned to institutions that are never picked up literally won't survive because they don't have that connection. They could be fed, they could be changed, but if there isn't the connection to another adult, they will have a failure to thrive. And so we want to understand the risks that are associated with trauma right out of the gates. Um, this is going to be on page six of your guide. So if you guys are going to follow along, like I said, this is a six hour training that we're condensing down to an hour and a half, the high level overview. So we're going to skip some pages today. It doesn't mean they're not worthwhile, <laughs> but we want to make sure that um, you get all the really high points. Okay. Um, so here we have the risks associated with trauma. There are six of them. And what I want you to notice is that the first half of them are there before a child even really hits the ground, okay? So here's when we're talking about what's going on with biology, when we're talking about what's going on with brain development, so much is happening in utero. Difficult pregnancy can play into a lot. There's so much sensory development that's happening in pregnancy and in the birthing process and then in early hospitalization. We will dig in a little bit more about sensory processing a little bit later today, but when we're talking about behaviors, often they can have to do with sensory issues, with sensory processing, okay? A lot of these things are in development in utero during pregnancy. The baby is experiencing everything the mom is experiencing, not just what she's eating, Okay, but the environment around her, the level of stress that's coursing through her body, right? All of that is happening in utero to that unborn child. All right, so we have to understand um, during pregnancy is when the most rapid brain development is happening. So as Amberly was talking about the hand model, right? It starts with our brainstem, and then our limbic system forms, and then finally our cortex. So if you think about all the structure and all the intricacy that's necessary during pregnancy for that little tiny person to come out into the world. And then during birth, the birthing process is when so many of our senses and our reflexes start to connect or don't, okay? Um, we, are, we are designed intelligently on purpose for the things to work together perfectly. Now, sometimes, Medical intervention is necessary, okay? We want that baby to be born, and if there's a problem, a C-section becomes necessary. But what can happen is that there becomes some sensory interruption in the process, 
Okay? Doesn't mean it can't be mitigated, but if we don't know about it, it can go on unidentified for a long time until issues start to present themselves behaviorally or educationally, and then intervention that we could have done at a very young age, we miss out on. Okay? Um, early hospitalization. When a baby is born, that baby is supposed to come right out of mama and then skin to skin, right? That happens for the purpose of, of regulation. Regulation. And so our, the very first sense that's fully formed at birth is touch. So the sense of touch on our skin is the very first sense that's fully developed at birth. That is why touch is so important. We're going to talk a lot about healthy touch today. We cannot not touch each other. We have to touch each other to be healthy. Our bodies require it. Our nervous systems require it. Touch is calming. When we don't have that, our bodies are out of alignment. It doesn't work right. And so this is why when a baby has to, if there's a complication during pregnancy or birth and a baby has to be whisked away, even for really important medical intervention, okay? Because those things are important. We want this child to survive. But if they don't get that contact right here, right out of the gates, there are reflexes in this child's development that will not close so the next one can build and close. And this is where we end up with some sensory interruption or sensory processing disorder or... Uh, diagnoses like ADD, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, okay? So understanding that pregnancy is huge, the birthing process is incredibly important, connection to mom and dad right out of the gates is super important. Any interruption there can interrupt our brain development, can interrupt our sensory development. That's as soon as the kid's born. Then we're talking about the other three that we think more commonly about, right? Tra abuse, neglect, and trauma. But there can be so much going on in these little brains and bodies way before or instead of abuse and neglect. There can always be more at play, which is why it's so important to ask those questions. What happened to you? What's the need behind the behavior? Why, when you're erasing your problem, are you making a hole in your paper? Why do you break the pencil all the time? Is this willful disobedience? Or is this a sensory issue? These are some of the questions that we have to start asking a little bit differently, instead of just assuming that we know the answer. Does that make sense? So there are six stages of major brain development, and we've already we've talked about the prenatal. That's in utero. That's the that's the big time where we're, our brain is developing a huge uh, brain growth year. And then the next, obviously, your brain is always growing in these in this time period. But these are what they've identified as as extreme brain growth. Like so, these are very important if if there's interruption there. And so the first year. Um, so we are born with the ability to attach, but we learn attachment that first year. So that's a really important um, develop brain growth year, and it's really important to have that attachment. And by, by saying that, um, whoever is the caregiver, they're the regulator. So they're regulating the baby. So that first year of life, they, they depend completely 100% on somebody to regulate them and meet their needs. Then um, the next time that they've identified in your life that is a big brain development year is age five. So what do we do at age five? We go to kindergarten. And so not only are we changing and going to a new place and learning a new thing, but our brain is growing and developing in a huge way. And when we're five, we, we um, look for commonalities. You know, we want to go to whoever looks like us, acts like us, we play with everybody, we love you on the playground, we don't like you right now, we love you again. You know, um, kindergarten can be, it's a very big learning year, learning how to deal with each other and, um, and just, you know, this is a lot going on. And then age eight is the next year that they've identified as a big brain growth year, so that is... What grade? Third grade. Third grade, grade. typically third grade, right? So that's it. 
that's a huge um, develop that year during that brain development it's very modeling is very important they're really paying attention to um, the adults and the regulators in the room they um, that's when they start noticing um, differences and if you've ever worked with uh, elementary school kids there is a difference at least in my experience between second grade and third grade they start noticing what's different and they also start noticing what's in this person's lunchbox versus what's in this person's <laughs> lunchbox or what's on their plate or who's picking them up sometimes or who's at the bus stop. I mean, kids are really starting to learn. And this is when modeling behavior is very important. It's always important, but this is, this is a huge development year. And this, kids, kids all this time in, in, um, during elementary school, they really need a co-regulator, right? It's not... It's not that they're um, in third grade and they can take tests now and they can, you know, do go to the bathroom by themselves or whatever. It's not. They still need a co-regulator. They still need somebody to walk alongside them and teach and help them stay regulated and teach them what is appropriate and what isn't. Okay, so it's a big development year. The next um, age that everybody's identified is 12. So what happens typically at 12? Which grade? Sixth grade. Sixth grade. Middle school, middle school right? So we, so we typically blame everything. And this, is, this was at one of my trainings. The uh, professor said, you know, we blame everything in middle school on hormones. But it's a huge brain development year, right? Literally, so, the 12-year-old brain is undergoing reconstruction. Yeah. So what fires together, wires together, right? The brain is plastic. You're learning constantly. Um, at our last training, they said, which is, I'm going to go off topic for a second, but they said, your brain is rewiring constantly until you're 50, and even after 50, it's rewiring. But you have the ability to rewire things easily until around the age of 50, and then even after the age of 50, you're still, you still can be rewired. But around age 12, there's a literal reconstruction yes. that's happening. Mm -hmm. And so during those first 12 years, the brain is just taking in all this information. Like, think about how much an elementary student consumes in education, right? It's all this foundational stuff. At around age 12, when adolescence begins, do not confuse adolescence with puberty. They are not the same thing, okay? Puberty is happening, and sometimes puberty is happening even earlier in many of our kids now, as early as third grade. Puberty will start, which is obviously the release of hormones and bodies changing and all of that. In addition to that is this period of adolescence. This period of adolescence is when the brain is being reconfigured. And what's happening is that the brain is, like Amberly said, what fires together, wires together. And so it is being pruned away what isn't being utilized on a regular basis. And it's like this, it's, it's called the myelination of the brain. It's like creating a super highway for neuro connections in the brain is what's happening from 12 to into your 20s. And so your brain is completely rewiring, and you've got hormones going, going on. And you've got um, this right at your fingertips, right? And things are coming at our kids and our, and our students and our family members so quickly. They, it's just so hard to process. And this is also such a questioning time, because when your brain is rewiring, you naturally are questioning, right? Because you're, you're getting all this new information, and things are firing up. And so if you've ever noticed a kid that might feel safe in a classroom when they're around the age in sixth grade, they ask a lot of questions, right? And maybe if they don't feel safe, they ask a lot of questions. To, I mean, who knows? But kids are asking a lot of questions. And so this, again, is a very important modeling year. It's also a really important time for the uh, adult in the room the, to be regulated and mindful. Because at any given moment, even... <laughs> Even the most typical kid is going to go with this because they're rewiring. So, so big, big time. Um, then the next one is age 16. And so what do we do at 16? Say, go drive. Go get on the highway. <laughs> and you can see the dysregulation, right? Like on Highway 27. I know sometimes I'm on Highway 27. So, um, but that's another huge um, brain development and we've got a lot going on in high school there, right? We've got a lot we're dealing with. Friends coming, friends going, 
um, some serious things happen, especially here in Hounds County. We've had some serious community tragedy. Um, so there's a lot. There's a, there's a lot of disruption. And um, around that age, there can be a lot of disruption around that age. So that's why it's so important to, to be mindful that there's so much more going on with that 16-year-old in front of you than just being defiant. They're, they're rewiring. Yeah, and additionally, one of the things that we need to understand, too, when, when our kids are hitting this period of adolescence, and I really wish I knew this 19 years ago. Okay, I have an 18-year-old right now who's a senior, um, and a 17-year-old who's a junior, and a 9-year-old who's in fourth grade. I wish I had known any of this 19 years ago, but I really wish I had known any of this when my son was starting middle school. Because what I didn't understand, and what I know to be true now, is that when our kids are young and they're in elementary, we're very instructional, right? How many of you guys are very instructional with young kids, right? We're teaching them constantly uh, what to know, what to expect, how to be, right? Our, our style with them can be very instructional. Well, when they hit that adolescent period, when they hit 12, 13, 14, and so on, we've laid that instructional foundation. They know us. They know our morals. They know what we expect. They know the information. Now they're trying to understand it and digest it for themselves. They're saying, who am I and what's my place in this world? They still need us to be even more present, but in a very different way. They need us to be their coach. They need us to come alongside them. They don't need us to be their friend as a parent. They got plenty of those, okay? And friends become even more important in this season than you would begin to imagine, right? There's a lot of influence that begins to happen with friends. It looks much different by age 12 and into middle and high school than it did in elementary school. But as the adults, whether we are their primary caregiver or we are the adult in the room with them at school on a regular basis, we've got to understand that what they need from us has less to do with instruction and much more to do with co-regulation. They need us to walk with them. They need us to listen to their questions and guide them well. That's what they need from us because they have the ability to process information. They've been doing it for 12 years, right? But they need us to understand who they are and where they're coming from. Every single one of us needs to feel seen, heard, and valued. Think about the last time that you personally felt ignored, misunderstood, or unappreciated. Think about how it felt in here. It changes our behavior. It changes the way we respond in situations. When we don't feel seen, heard, or valued, it changes the way we deal with the person across from us. Always, always. And so we've got to understand that while our kids need lots of instruction when they're young, it just shifts when they turn into adolescence. If we're still instructional, if we're still coming at them in that way, there's gonna be a lot more resistance to it. <coughs> But if we are asking questions, and if we are listening, and if we are guiding, right, they still need the co-regulation. I need Amberly to co-regulate me all the time. I always need it because we were created to be interdependent on one another. But what they need from us in that season looks different. There's another book that we reference a lot called Brainstorm. And it's Dan Siegel's book that picks up where the whole brain child leaves off. And this is 12 to into your 20s, okay? Because that adolescent period goes all the way into our mid to late 20s, depending on if you're male or female. I'll let you decide which one takes a little longer. <laughs> a few jokes to be said there. <laughs> okay, this question, because, you know, you started out on lows with um, trauma-based issues that affect the child moving on. And, and the old guys like me and Larry, you know, back in those, sorry, you know, we came obviously from a different time growing up a lot less stimuli, and I can see the, the trauma part being a lot more focused on what you hit on, um, you know, the family life and on and on. So a lot of, I guess, where does a lot of the issues we're having with kids in school now 
if it's not a trauma-based, where does the, the stimuli and where they're getting everything else that's at these ages, you know, it's impacting their mind. Um, you know, they're learning a lot of things off of the phone that may be incorrect, and, and maybe it's moving that mind wire in a different direction than uh, they're not using what the things that we want them to use. You get where I'm going? Just yeah, I don't know if I'm going to answer your question exactly, Reese. So just let me know. I mean, I'm going to do my best, um, but I'm not. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but I'll, I'll tell you what I think. Because when I did a training at a church last week, I had a similar question from somebody. And um, what I think the the whole point of TBRI and what we're explaining is that it's very relation relational based. And I think one of the reasons why we had so much trouble because of COVID, we blamed a lot on COVID, is because there wasn't a lot of relational things going on. We weren't even seeing people's faces, which our brain learns a lot from seeing somebody's face. So we can identify what we know for sure in Highlands County. What I can tell you and I can promise you in Highlands County from working in the classroom is we have a huge amount of kids that come from trauma and stress that come from situations that are totally out of our control as a classroom teacher. But what I can also tell you, even the students that don't come from trauma or stress, there are students that have experienced tough things. And so understanding the brain growth and how much relationships, how important relationships are, is, is, is this. So while we can, I think what you're saying is we, we, when we, we see a behavior, we can say, well, that child um, was in foster care, or that child's um, dad left, or they have to live with their aunt on Wednesday through Sunday and their other aunt on um, Monday through Wednesday or something. So we want to identify, that's why that kid acts that way, right? That's what we want to do. But that doesn't help us change how, he, how that child acts in school with the teacher. Is that what you're saying? Like, you're saying we can identify traumatic things and make ex and, and really well, honestly it. giving an excuse for the for the behavior in the classroom but yeah to to a big degree i mean um i i heard reese's question a little different okay maybe you did yeah because we probably are can i give it a shot reese can can i give the the Absolutely. answer to your question a shot okay. really quick okay um, I heard you challenging a little bit more about okay well if there's not a lot of trauma what about what about like phones and media and everything that's coming at our kids so rapid fire. Is that, was that a little bit more of where your question was headed? Yeah, because I think they, they're getting, it, it may not yeah. be relationship with parents, parents anymore, you know, it may, right. the phone is keeping right. them occupied, the everything else, um, yeah. and what they're getting from, from all the stimuli there, right. which could eventually be a behavior learned that's causing the disruptions in class and the disrespect and, and everything else that we're dealing with. Yeah. So let me go back and just start with TBRI is trust-based relational intervention. Okay. If we don't feel safe, right? And felt safety is not the same thing as actual safety. Okay. A kid, in this room, I know that I'm safe physically, right? But I might not feel safe if there's somebody in the room that I have a, a, a tough relationship with, okay? So felt safety, if I don't feel safe, it doesn't matter if I am safe. If I don't feel safe, my behavior will be affected by that. So if I'm a kid in a classroom, for example, right? And because of my experience, because of my situation, because of my family history, I can, I can know like that the building is safe, right? But if I don't feel safe in that space with the people that I'm around, whether it's another student, whether it's the teacher, whether it's the administration, if I don't feel safe, I'm gonna be here. I'm gonna be triggered and I'm gonna be on high alert. And it could be something as small as somebody bumping into me that, that makes me respond in a way where if I had felt safety and I was regulated, I wouldn't respond that way. Now, to your question about everything that's coming at our kids so quickly, of course it impacts the brain. Of course it does. There are studies being done right now. We don't, we don't even know the total impact of COVID. We don't even know the total impact 
of the volume of messages that are coming at our kids on a regular basis that are impacting the way that they think, that are impacting the way that they process. We know that it's having an impact, but it has yet to be fully quantified. But what we do know is that healing comes in the context of safe and healthy relationships. Technology cannot replace that. It cannot. It is much different when we are all standing here in the room together than it is if we were to have been on a screen for Zoom. True? Yes. Right? And we've, we've really kind of normalized the screen for Zoom because we had to through COVID. Yeah, we had no choice. But what we know and what the science tells us is that healing takes place in the context of trusting healthy relationships. And now we're going to start talking about the TBRI principles and strategies that help us understand what does that mean? What is a trusting, healthy relationship? And how do we get there to actually be able to do it to help ourselves and our kids stay regulated so that we can be a thriving community? Fair enough? And, and I not disagree at all. I just I know you go back to touch and how important touch is and and me, I know communication. I like I'd rather call somebody anymore. Our kids are getting to the point where they don't even call. It's a text anything that's you know, you're losing the touch, you're losing uh, So I guess what I was in a roundabout way trying to say is that we, you know, so much of what's happened can go back to relationships and the breakdown of relationships. And it happens with kids that come from tough places and kids that don't come, yeah. um, because we have all this, all these things at our fingertips, and it, and it's not relational, right? Um, just like Facebook, so much easier to argue on Facebook than it is when you're having to look at somebody in their eyes and say something nasty. It's the same at school. It's the same here, just like what she's saying. And I think that's what I was going to get to with you was that it's, it's just so relational and, and we can look at so many things that aren't working and it's because there's a disconnect in relationships. And there just is. And it happens with everybody. But with TBRI, we want to be, the principles and strategies of TBRI help us understand how to be in healthy relationship with one another. And that's what we're about to dig into. Um, I think what we need to look at talking about the iPhone and all the technology stuff. One thing we have to remember is relationships are not only rewarding, but they're work. And sometimes you have to give and take on a relationship. Sure. When you're dealing with an iPhone, you're in control. When you're dealing with a computer, you're in control. And I don't care what anybody says, because I was a kid at one time. Kids are basically selfish. They want to be in control. So I think this is something that we have to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. They're escaping to that because it's easier to deal with. Sure. I could be wrong. I'm Again, relationships, person. relationships, relationships, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, the principles of TBRI are connecting, empowering, and correcting. And this is going to be on page 9 of your guide. Um, however, on page 7, I just want you to underline, circle, or highlight something really important for me. Okay, on page seven, in the little box, it says the brain is plastic, meaning it can change throughout the lifespan. Okay, that's really important for us to remember, whether we are dealing with kids or whether we are dealing with adults. Where there is breath, there is hope. Just because something is a certain way today does not mean that it has to be that way tomorrow. Okay, any damage that's been done can be healed. And we're going to talk about how we can get there. So I think so much of what we do in, in life and in schools and everywhere is we, we look at this. We, we want to correct, right? And we are more reactive rather than proactive. Just, it's just how, how it is, right? Because we're reacting to situations so much more than thinking about how we cannot get to that situation. We can I guess. So we start so so many times, so many things that we do start out with correcting the behavior, we're whack a mole it, all the things that she said, and then empowering and connecting come last. And that
triangle is upside down. And so this is my favorite uh, triangle to look at. And um, is we want to connect. Connecting is the base, right? That's the foundation. You wouldn't build a two-story house on cardboard. You wouldn't build, you wouldn't put blocks on the second story and cardboard on the first story, right? So we have to build a great foundation, and that is where connecting comes. We have to connect with the people that we're working with, the people that we're in community with, and the, pe and the, the kids and families that we're um, interacting with every day. So connection is so, so important. Again, speaking to Reese and their relationship and, you know, how important. That's where we can build trust. That's where felt safety comes. Then, when we do have that connection, empowering becomes so much easier. Kids, kids and people would love to be empowered by you because they're connected. And then correcting, not so much. The triangle becomes much, much easier. So we're not correcting as much because we've connected. We've empowered and now the correcting is happening a lot less. That's the best way to look at TBRI and our foundations. And so we start with mindfulness. Okay, as the adult in the room, you are the one in control. You are the one with the power to share. Okay, and so we start with mindfulness because again, like we've said many times already, if I'm triggered, right, if I flip my lid, I can't bring somebody else to a place of regulation so that they're engaged with language, logic, and reason, and they're ready to learn. It just won't happen. So I have to be mindful first. That means I have to understand myself. I have to understand my own triggers. Why do I think the way I do? I have to be mindful of my interactions with other people. I will tell you that eye rolls or huffs or disrespect is a huge trigger for me. A huge trigger for me. And for the longest time, I was a no mom. Okay, the first word out of my mouth because it was, I wanted to control the situation. I thought I was doing what was right, what was best, right? But as I started to learn more and I started to understand more, what I realized is that me trying to maintain all this control was harming my relationships. It wasn't helping my relationships. It wasn't creating the safety that I thought I was creating, right? These good boundaries for everybody to know what their lane was. No, instead, it wasn't, it wasn't honoring the other person at all. And so my kids, before they even asked a question, they assumed the answer was no, even for the small stuff. And there's no felt safety there. Let me do something with you really quick. Close your eyes, if you would, for me. Are they closed? Okay. No. I said no. Stop. Absolutely not. Don't. Enough. No. No. No more. Be done. No. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Let's do that. Yes. Yes. Good idea. Yes. 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 Open your eyes. <laughs> what did your body feel? <laughs> my See, my breathing slowed down. I'm sorry? My breathing slowed down when you got to the yes part. What happened during the no part? Well, not realizing it was higher, and then when he started saying yes, I just slowed down. My breathing slowed down. You had a physiological response to my words and my tone. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I'm saying no. I was, like, with my eyes were blinking, even though they were closed. <laughs> I could feel it. Did you feel safe with me when I kept telling you no? You had a physiological response to the way I was speaking to you. And then what happened with the yeses? Peace. Peace. Validation. Seen, heard, value. Felt safety. We can feel it. It's just in that small exercise, you guys. Can I say something? I kept my eyes open because I wanted to see you. Because that's usually how 
how it is. It's face to face when you're being told no, and your face changed dramatically. Sure. Of course it does. Sure. It's so interesting. Oh, we're going to dig into that in just a minute, too. You're like ahead of the game. <laughs> These things matter, you guys. You just felt it in your body. And if you felt it in your body, then those that we interact with out in the world feel it in theirs. It's not just restricted to a kid in the classroom. Okay. So mindfulness is a key strategy in connection, right? If I'm not mindful of the words I'm using and the way I'm saying them, and the conditions of what's happening in the environment that we're in. Okay, if I'm not mindful of that, I can trigger somebody else's response and trigger their behavior to go in a direction I don't want it to go in. So there's, there's some responsibility that comes with this, right? I will tell you, as a parent who did not know these things for a very long time, I have had to learn them, and I still have to practice them every day. Praise God that what fires together wires together, and that the brain is plastic because I'm hopeful that someday it will become my nature. But it's not my nature. I am having to learn these things because I know that they work. The science tells us that they work. And my experience with it, both in Ethiopia and in the US, tells me that it works. And <clears throat> to speak to the, the, the relationships being work, being mindful is, is work. Like it's. It's hard to do, but it's something you can teach. And when you're teaching mindfulness, just like she went to the no's and the yeses, it's, it's so much easier to be mindful, right? I'm doing um, some a structured course with a middle school class in Lake Placid, and we're doing a little bit of making sense of your worth and some TBRI stuff. But, um, you know, when I was teaching last week, they were, like, I, I was getting so triggered by some of the behaviors and I kept thinking, oh my gosh, I'm teaching them mindfulness and I don't think I can be mindful. But it's, um, but it really was helpful, like you said, you know, I, I was really paying attention to what my body language was saying and what my words were saying and trying to get them to come on board with me so we can get the train moving and they can learn a few things. So um, the next strategy is engagement strategy. And this, so <clears throat> in TBRI and connecting, there's two strategy, strategies. The second one is engagement strategies. And one of the easiest strategies to do is what they call behavior matching. And the reason why that's easy is because you don't have to think of anything. You can just do what the person is doing across from you. So if they're doing this, you can do this. If they're doing this, you can do this. If they're sitting like a mermaid, you can do that. If you're sitting crisscross applesauce, you can do that. Whatever it is that the child in front of you is doing, or the person even is doing, you can do it, and you're mirroring their behavior, and you're saying some things to that child without even saying it. You have a good idea. I like what you're doing. What you're doing is, is valuable. I really like you. I see you, I, and I want to play with you. The other thing um, with behavior matching is you don't have to think of anything, and it comes, and it can be super, super easy. And it's playful. And play disarms fear. Write that down. Okay? Mm -hmm. Just think about how your fear was a little disarmed when she started saying yes. And her voice got softer and her face got softer. Right? So, but just remember, play disarms fear. So if if Reese is talking to me and he's doing like this, and I walk up and do this and talk back, and then he might laugh and we can laugh about it and we can disarm fear, right? Because adults get fearful. So that's an easy thing to do, just um, behavior matching, because you don't have to think of anything. And nurturing touch. So I'm a touch, touchy person, so COVID was extremely difficult for me. I'm sure I've touched a lot of you today. I'm trying to get better and say, hey, can I, you know, can I touch you? And also, obviously, in the school system, we have to be mindful about appropriate touching. But if you have a child that doesn't like to be touched, or if you're an adult that doesn't like to be touched, that's OK. You can just say. So you're getting the gesture that I am going to touch you and my arm's here and I'm here for you, but I'm not actually physically touching you. But since I know Danielle, I can run and say, how are you? And I can touch her and give her some warm eyes, which will be the next thing. Um, one of the things in our classes that uh, Amanda Purvis said is, she said, if you're not prepared to look at people with precious eyes, don't ask for their eyes. And so one of the things in TBRI that we were taught 
it kind of shocked me when she said that because I was like, wait, wait, we're supposed to always get eye contact, right? So we can connect. Like, we're supposed to always get eye contact. I was the sixth grader in the room. Um, we're always supposed to get eye contact. She goes, well, not if you don't have warm eyes. Because you know when your mom or your caregiver gave you that look, like, you better knock it off. And you probably did, right? Or you didn't, and a wooden spoon, or God knows what came out. But anyway, um, so that warm eyes are so important, right? Warm eyes are so important. And, it's, and, and that's the whole mindful piece coming back again. Because we have to remember that this person in front of us is as precious as I am. And I, what I always like to think about is when I'm looking at a kid, I always get down. Because I want to be on my level. Because this is not fun, is it? It's not very fun. When I, even if I smile at you, it's not fun. It's more fun if I'm looking at you and getting... Because then we're on the same page, right? We're on the same wavelength. Um, out or below. Out or below. Out or right. below. Out or below. below. Yeah. It disarms... Again, disarms my, po my posture change in here. Just disarm. I just saw three of you smile at me all of a sudden. Yeah. I'm thinking, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. So you can pull, pull up a chair. Yeah, I can do that. Or you can just bend over. You know, we don't, like, it, you know, not everybody's going to be able to squat down enough, but it's good exercise. It'll really help you out. Um, but warm eyes are very important. And one thing that I realized um, a, a while ago when I was dealing with parents, because like I said, this helped me more with my peers than it did. Um, kids, even though I find it very helpful with kids, is I would look at a parent and think to myself, they love their child as much as I love mine. Mm -hmm. So I have to, I want to look at them with those same eyes. They may not be doing the things that I did, but they do love their child. So I always try to think that in my head. That helps me have warm eyes. Voice quality, obviously, it's important. You already got the no and the yes and the... But, you know, when I'm talking loud and I'm getting aggravated and I want you guys to pay attention and just understand this, that's not so fun. But when I'm calm, that helps me stay regulated, too. So voice quality, like cadence, whether you're talking fast, if you're talking slower, softer, louder, all of these things, if we can be mindful about in, these, in this connecting principle in these strategies, um, help us uh, disarm fear and help kids stay regulated. Because just like Danielle said, when her voice got loud, her eyes were blinking. And so she probably wasn't even hearing. You know, your amygdala started to get engaged. You're not even really hearing what the person is saying, but you feel stress from the voice. Mm -hmm. And then always, of course, we want to be playful. Always be playful, because that disarms fear. I was just going to say, <laughs> why do we play? Mm -hmm. It disarms fear. Kids learn through play. Kids learn through play. I'm going to say it one more time. <laughs> Kids learn through play. Play is one of the most powerful tools that we have, and I think we underutilize it all the time. And I will tell you, I am learning to play. It does not come naturally for me. It is not my go-to. I need Amberly in my life <laughs> because she is really good at it. <laughs> You're good at structure. <laughs> but TBRI is a balance of structure and nurture. It is a balance of structure and nurture. There is no room for bad behavior. There's no room for disrespect, okay? That's the structure side of it. But where we have high structure, we also have to have high nurture because that's the way that it will be received. When it is only high structure and very little nurture, that is a breeding ground for rebellion and that is never gonna work it's never going to get us the outcome that we want. Connection doesn't take place. Connection doesn't take place. That's right. So how do we build connection? What does it look like to have healthy attachment? Okay. This is a fun part, right? So the attachment cycle, you, you're born with the ability to attach, but you learn it your first year of life. So that's what, when we were talking about earlier, the caregiver in the room is the regulator. So what happens when you're a baby? When the baby cries, you pick it up. The baby cries you pick it up. And so what happens when the baby cries? What are we doing? We're picking up, we're looking at the baby, we're talking to the baby soft, right? We're at, we're trying to figure out, we feed the baby, change the baby's diaper, the baby's still crying, we might put him in the car seat and drive around. We, we're doing all the things to try to get this baby to stop crying, right? We're regulating that baby. We're letting that baby know, we see you, we hear you. And so then that baby knows, 
from the from within a, the first week of life. Oh wow, my voice matters. I, and somebody found this person whose voice is soft. I can't focus, but I hear this soft voice. You know, we know that babies respond to soft voices right away, even when they can't see. So um, they, that is something that a child learns the first year of life. They learn seen, heard, and valued when their needs are met and they're comfortable. And we're detectives. Like we're, and I always say um, in some of the trainings that I think, and it goes on throughout life. Like I feel like moms and teachers should, should be hired by FBI and things like that because we're amazing detectives. We're always trying to figure it out, right? And the figuring out of why this baby or this child is screaming at me doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. We might be able to pick the baby up and cry. I mean, hold them and care for them when they're 12. But we can look them in the eye and we can, we can still be detectives and we have to. Yeah, and there's a lot going on inside the body here, you guys. So when a baby cries, they're in distress, right? Uh, now, when it's a baby, we don't know what it is. Like you were just saying, we have to be detectives. Um, are they wet? Are they hungry? Are they tired? Are they cold? What is it? We have to be their external regulator. We have to meet their need because they can't do it for themselves. So they cry because they're in distress. The sympathetic nervous system kicks in, right? That's where, like, they're feeling all the feels right? The excitatory neurotransmitters are kicking in. That means adrenaline and cortisol are coursing, 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 coursing. But when we pick them up and we meet their need emotionally as well as physically, okay, because both are required there, felt safety is found in relationship, okay? So if I just mechanically pick up a baby, change its diaper, and put it back down, I met the physical need, right? but I didn't comfort the distress. So it's a two-part process there. And so when I do comfort the distress, the body calms and dopamine kicks in, okay? We need that inhibitory neurotransmitter. We need that parasympathetic nervous system to kick in. And that's exactly what builds this cycle that Amberly was just talking about. It builds the foundations for trust, for self-worth, my voice matters. This person will be there for me over and over and over and over and over again. I know that they will come. I have a voice. They will respond to it. And as a result, I can calm down. I can be regulated, right? It's a foundation for good mental health. However, when the baby cries and no one comes, or the baby cries, and no one is there to meet the need emotionally, even if my physical needs are being met, but no one is there comforting me, there's a disruption here. Because the dopamine, the parasympathetic nervous system, does not kick in, okay? And so when that happens, it's what you saw in the video, where the cortisol just keeps being released as if there is a truck coming at you all day long. And so what happens when the caregiving is not consistent? Well, at two to three years old, it looks like behavioral dysregulation. It looks like a kid who tantrums and cannot be calm, who might be slamming their head against the wall, right? That's literally what it looks like. Four to six years old, it looks like ADD, ADHD, a kid who can't focus, right? It looks like that. It doesn't mean that it is that. But this is the effect that trauma, and this is trauma, okay? This is the effect that trauma has on the brain and body. By eight to 10 years old, it looks like depression and anxiety, right? By 12 years old, we're moving into serious mental health issues. And this is if the needs continue to not be met. But where there's breath, there's hope. And when we can intervene and try to meet some of these needs and understand the brain development, like if a child um, at the age of, you know, uh, at the age of six didn't have some needs met and have some attachment issues, they may, you, they may look at you and act like a two-year-old because their brain is not developed. They miss that developmental stage. So when you're the detective in the room and the regulator in the room, you're looking at the child and you have to say to yourself, am I dealing with a six-year-old? Or am I dealing with a two-year-old that didn't have needs? And then if you can start thinking that way, then you can kind of understand their behavior. 
don't excuse the behavior. We still need that to we still need that child to do what they're supposed to do so we can keep the train going because we have 25 other children. But maybe we can stop for one second and say, am I dealing with the six-year-old or the two-year-old? Or am I dealing with the six-year-old that's been so self-sufficient for the last five years that maybe they're 13? Maybe they've done so much for themselves, they're the older child. So again, like unfortunately or fortunately, however you guys want to think about it, you know, we're constantly having to be detectives when we're dealing with anybody, a six-year-old or a 60-year-old. I mean, we're constantly having to try to figure out who, who are we dealing with it? What's the need behind the behavior? Yeah. yeah, because in that triggering, kids from trauma, adults from trauma, mm -hmm. can be half their chronological age in that state of fight, flight, or freeze. Okay? So you can have a nine-year-old who, in a triggered state, is behaving more like a four-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, that same nine-year-old who has been in survival mode for so long, could be exhibiting behaviors that look more teenage. Okay. So again, we want to try to get that child or that person back to a place of regulation so that they can be operating with their full brain and be in that space of being their chronological age. Okay. But their experiences are impacting that triggered behavior. Okay. It's taking them back to fear, it is taking them back to harm, right? And so we want to get back here as quickly as possible. And so that's where we want to disarm the fear. We want to try to create that felt safety. It is only in the context of connecting that we can build felt safety. There is not another way to do it. It is only in the context of connecting and relationships to be able to build felt safety with one another, okay? Um, when we train this, for a longer period of time, <laughs> we go deep into each of these, okay? We go into the practical application of each of these. We go into the implementation of each of these, right? Um, because you have a, we actually have two hour trainings just on connecting. So when we're dealing, when we're talking with teachers and, and community members and the, the, at the church volunteers that take care of like daycare and the youth, um, we, we actually do two hours connecting we do a two-hour empowering and a two-hour correcting because you can go so deep and you can get so many tools in your toolbox, but it's just a lot to learn at one time. So in this three-hour, we just overview it quickly. So now we're going to step into our empowering principles, okay? And teachers love these, right? Because we're talking about the wisdom of the body. That would be the physiological strategies. And then the wisdom of places. That's the ecological strategies. Okay, so remember each principle has two strategies underneath it and a whole bunch of tools. So we're going to start with the physiological strategies. Okay, so this is kind of simple um, and this is something easy that we can do. This is what we would call low hanging fruit, right? It's um, simple, but it's, it's like huge. Yeah, it's so huge. simple to do, but it makes a big difference. So one of the things that we always make sure there's water bottles and some snacks and things is so you're hydrated and your blood sugar is even, and you're okay as we're training this, because if you're thirsty at all, you've lost 10% of your brain function. And I need all the brain function I can get, so I drink the whole time, and I drink all day long. So um, hydration is so simple. So if you're thirsty at all, you're losing brain, you've already lost some, some brain function, and that's how kids are. They've got to have constant hydration. And, you know, COVID did that wonderful thing where we have water bottles everywhere. But it's important to remind them, right, because we're their co-regulators. Hey, you thirsty? You need something to drink? You need something to eat? Um, and that is something that we can do. Um, we can do, like, that is something, and I've told Marissa before, before I knew about TBRI, I would have kids that walk in the room, and I'd say, hey, you know, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Go talk to me. I put my hand up, you know. And I knew it wasn't going to really do any good. To, now, when I say this, I don't mean that the deans were any good. They were fab fabulous. But it wasn't going to do that child who was in credit recovery and needed to be in that class to graduate to, from high school so they could walk across that stage for me to send them out of the room to go to the dean because they were rude to me and said something they shouldn't have and um, you know, possibly get more days out of my room when I really just needed them to be there on their phone book so we could get that credit recovery done, right? So luckily, 
bad words and eye rolls don't trigger me. Now, don't leave your clothes on the floor. That really gets me mad. <laughs> but for some reason, eye rolls, that's just the way I was made. That doesn't trigger me. So I was okay with eye rolls and, 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 and fussing at me. And I would say, and I'm telling you this, I, I saw it happen every single day in my classroom. Those kids would come in, they would be, mm, and um, I'd say, you want a granola bar? You need some water? I always had snacks in my room. And within 10 minutes, they would be sitting down. We would be able to have a conversation that I could actually hear what they were saying. They weren't grunting at me. And they would start to do their work. And lots of times they weren't just hungry and thirsty. And they were just tired. You know, um, so it was a big thing, and it teaches them to recognize. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. You know how you get when you get hungry. We get, we hungry. Hangry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Who's been hangry in the room? You know? Who's been hangry? Another, um, another thing that I do, which you know, whatever. But I, 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 I did it at the um, at the guidance counselor thing, and I've actually had a few guidance counselors email me, and I email them P charts. And on, at our school in Lake Placid, we put pee charts on the back of all the stalls. And for the little kids, it's colors. And to the, be clear, Lakeview. Yeah. And for the big kids, yeah, sorry. And for the big kids, well, I don't know. I sent them to some poet school guidance counselors. I hope they, they asked. I hope they're there. <laughs> but it's just, it's just letting kids know if, you're, if your urine is dark, then you probably need to drink some water. You're dehydrated. You're not learning well. Your brain function is low. And I can tell you, at Lakeview Christian, the kids will come running down the aisle, Mrs. Rogers, I'm number four, I drank, I drank, you know, they get so excited, and, and it teaches, and then I say to them, well, what are you going to do? Because I can't fix it for them, just like I can't fix all their behaviors, but I can fix, a lot of times, kids are hungry, thirsty, have to go to the bathroom, need to drink more water, a lot of times, just those simple, simple things that are teaching them, I can stay more regulated. I, I have control over this. I can make some choices to keep myself on track. And I can learn what my body is feeling, right? right? They, if they can understand what their body is feeling, they can do something about it, right? Because we're moving from this place of external regulation when we're the detective picking right. up the baby, right, and trying to meet their needs, into this place of co-regulation. So now we're in this place of co-regulation, of walking alongside them and helping them understand this is what it feels like. They don't... No kid wants to be out of control. No kid wants to be in trouble. No kid doesn't want to know the answer, right? It's true of adults as well as it is for kids, right? But when the empowering principles exist for us to be able to teach kids and families how to get back to a place of regulation, if we start with this low-hanging fruit, oh my goodness, like, it's so easy to get there. When I first started learning about TBRI is when my kids were in middle school. And I was a little bit of a skeptic at first, right? Because again, I was a no mom, right? Had very traditional, like, this is how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to get it done. Moving on. Very dismissive in my, in my attachment style. Oh, you're hurt? <coughs> some You'll be fine. You're not bleeding. Right? That, that was me. You're making me feel so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, there's so much oh, power in a Band-Aid. There's so much power in a Band-Aid, you don't even know. We go, we can't do that today, but when we go deeper, we talk about it. It's amazing. Again, it's saying, I see you. I see that you have a hurt, and I'm willing to meet your needs. That's what it is. When I dismiss my kids, I pretend like their issues aren't important, or you're going to be fine, right? Because my life experience says just get up and keep moving, right? All they need in those moments is to be acknowledged. A Band-Aid is one of the most powerful tools we'll ever use. But anyway, that aside, I started with a snack bag, okay? Because I don't know if you've ever picked up a middle schooler <laughs> after school, okay? But it's mostly grunts and maybe a fine is all you're going to get, right? Until I introduced the snack bag in the car and gave them a bottle of water and had some granola bars and some other snacks. And all of a sudden, on our drive home, we were having conversations, right? It hadn't occurred to me that my kids were thirsty, hungry, probably hadn't used the bathroom all day, because hi, right? And so they just needed some of that physiological change. They needed their, they needed their physiological needs met, and then they could engage with me, right? But they're also, we talked before about sensory interruption, right? Sensory processing issues. 
when we do the full training, we'll go much deeper into sensory processing disorder and some of the very real physiological needs that our kids in our classrooms have that we can easily meet. So that again, we want to keep the train running. We get, and TBRI gets, TBRI in the classroom totally gets that it's very different when it's me and my nine-year-old and it's just one-on-one -on -one versus one-on-30. Okay? We get it. Like, it's not the same as same. But we'll talk about and teach about some strategies that can be utilized in that classroom space and what it looks like to be able to co-regulate in those spaces in addition to just the one-on-one. -on -one. Make sense? Okay. So Amberly just shared a lot about the wisdom of the body. Now we're going to talk about the wisdom of spaces. Okay. And so when we're talking about the ecological strategies of, of TBRI, we're talking a lot about the environment that we're in. Okay, the wisdom of places. And so with scaffolding, what we want to do is to be able to scaffold regulation. We go from being that external regulator, baby cries and pick it up, to walking alongside that child or friend, <laughs> adult, right, into this place of self-regulation. All right, so the goal is self-regulation, but even as a grown-up, there's not a point at which we just arrive in self-regulation. I don't know about you guys, but as an adult, I get dysregulated all the time, and I need the people around me to help me get back to a place of regulation so I can be fully engaged, right? Whether that's my husband or my colleague or another one of my best friends, right? We need that help to stay here or to get back to here. And so scaffolding does that for us. Additionally with scaffolding is we need to adjust our bar sometimes, okay? Because if the bar is set so high for me that I can never reach it, what do I stop doing? Trying. trying. I stop trying. I stop trying. So sometimes we have to adjust the bar. Amber Lee was talking about the kids that, walk in, that walked into her classroom, right? So if you had, you know, a, another kid mm -hmm. who, you know, is pretty typical developing and like moving right along in their education and that sort of thing, we can't expect every child that, or every person that walks into the room to be in the same exact place. Because there are some kids or teachers or parents who are walking into our spaces who did not have the same day that we had, who are not walking in with the same circumstances, right? And so we've got to be mindful of that. And sometimes we've got to adjust that bar a little bit. And it doesn't mean that our expectations don't stay high. But in the scaffolding process, sometimes we've got to lower the bar so somebody that can grab it, and then we lift it up. And they grab it, and then we lift it up. Because we want to get them here. Right? But it isn't, it, it, the expectations cannot always be exactly the same for every person that we're serving. It's not going to work. It's just not. So scaffolding is really important. Scaffolding for self-regulation and scaffolding for setting the bar. In addition to that, in the wisdom of the places, we've all seen the videos of the teachers that stand outside the classroom, high-fiving, having secret handshakes with each kid as they walk in, right? Those are awesome. Those are awesome. And those are something that we would call a daily ritual, OK? A daily ritual is a way that we interact with somebody that builds relationship, that builds felt safety. So again, creating those spaces to feel seen, heard, and valued. It can be as simple as standing outside the door and offering a handshake, a, five, a high five, or a fist bump. Acknowledging as kids are coming in, right? Or maybe it's the way that we start the morning, right? Um, maybe there's a certain thing that gets said back and forth. My kids each have a stay on handshake with their dad. Right? That's something that they share with him that's very personal, that builds relationship, and every time they do it, there's, there's laughter and connection being built. Right? So these simple daily rituals that we can build in, it can be the way we send kids out of the classroom. Right? But it's something that they come to expect from us. It's something that the other person comes to expect from us. My family on the phone, I always close the call with, I love you, goodbye. I love you, 
goodbye. If I don't say, I love you, bye, something has gone off the rails. <laughs> All right. So these small daily rituals that we can create with people create space for connection and felt safety. Finally, how many transitions happen during the school day? Too many to count. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Too many to count. Too many to count. For kids from hard places, transitions are very, very difficult. Very difficult. Substitutes. Like I can tell you, um, some of our students, um, they would really struggle with the substitute. And you could kind of almost know that that was going to be a struggle. And so if we can start recognizing that as a, as a issue, you know, we can be proactive instead of reactive. But if you think about it, I know... And I was a sub too, so it's tough. It's not easy, but that can really grow a kid that's a, you know, a student from a hard place that really throws them off when they're used to that certain person doing that certain thing. Um, and like she said, uh, as far as the rituals, there were days where I didn't make it to the door before kids started coming in. And the kids would be like, oh, I didn't think you were here. Like, it, it, was, it, it was something they were used to. And I'm talking about juniors and seniors in high school. I'm not talking about uh, five and six years. So it is really important for kids to just have that consistency. Obviously, you all know that, but um, a substitute can be a very triggering thing, just with not even opening their mouth, or just the fact that they're not their teacher. So even if we think about the transitions between classes, okay. right? Middle schoolers, how many classes are they going to each day? Right? They've got they've got seven. They've got seven different periods, and they've got even more hallway time, right? And they're dealing with different people for shorter blocks of time, right? And so you go from an elementary environment where um, you could have one or two teachers if there's co-teaching going on, right, to now seven different people. And so when you think about how challenging transitions are, just even think about your daily life, right? Like when you're going from, from one activity and then you have to transition into another activity and then, and then you layer in. Those are just daily transitions that we're talking about, right? Getting up, getting ready, getting out the door, going to work, having to go to multiple meetings, right? Going home, settling down out of your day, right? And so it's not different for kids. We, they have the same thing, but they might not have the tools to be able to handle those transitions well. Or maybe I have a lot of felt safety here. Oh, but man, when I got to go to this room, not so much. <laughs> right? And so um, as we're thinking about transitions, we have to understand the impact on, of transitions, especially on our kids from hard places, and how those transitions can be triggers for serious behavior. And finally, we're going to talk about the correcting principles. I know everybody wants to get here first, right? Let's just put, let's just put those behaviors away, right? Yeah. But here's the reality. We cannot get to the correcting if we have not built the felt safety first for the connecting and we haven't empowered. We have to have been able to connect it and empowered in order for the correcting to work. Because remember what we said before. TBRI is all about this balance of structure and nurture. Where there is a need for high structure, there has to be high nurture. If there is only high structure and not enough nurture, it is authoritarian, it is coming down, it is me standing over you and saying no. Over and over and over again. That builds no felt safety. It puts you immediately on the defensive and it creates rebellion. It creates disruption, discontent, and rebellion. It doesn't work. If punishment worked, if super high structure worked, our jails would not be full. It doesn't work. We have to approach it differently. I know that we want to fix it. I know we do. I did too. I did too. Every time I said no, every time I controlled, it was not out of ill intent. It was all I knew, and I didn't know another way to have it be healthier or better. I didn't, but now I do. 
And it doesn't make it easy. I still have to practice this because it is not my nature. It is not what I was raised in. It is not what I understood. But it is what I have learned from the science behind it and from the experience of seeing it implemented and it being effective, that it works. And so what does it mean to correct? Because, like I said, there's no room for bad behavior or disrespect. There's not. But how we go about it is what's going to change it. Okay, so um, choices. I, I do want to just piggyback on, on the corrective behavior because toward the end of my time at Stephen High School, one of the things that I did was process re referrals and things like that. I talked to Melissa a lot. Um, and we saw, we really did see, and, and again, you know, we don't have all the answers, um, but, and there's no excuse for bad behavior, but it would be so many times that it was the same thing. It was the same kid, the same referral, the same ISS, the same then OSS, because they did something in ISS they shouldn't have done. It was a kid that would be, in, and I could, I, I always would be able to see the trail. I was fortunate enough to where I was sitting, it was a lot, I would input them in the computer. I could see the trail from detention, they showed up late, so then they would get ISS. Then they pulled their phone out in ISS, and then they get OSS. It was like this, this, I could see the progression, and it was definitely a kid almost all the time that needed to be in school, that I was um, the senior sponsor, and I wanted that kid to walk across the stage to graduate. So it, it was a lot of times the same repeated thing. And I, I, I think about a handful of those kids sometimes since I've been going through this over the last two years, year. Um, and I just think I wish I had known to ask more questions. Even though I kind of asked a lot of questions anyway, <laughs> it's sort of my nature. But why didn't I ask more? What could I? So, so anyway, there, there's just a lot to look at. And I, and I know, again, this is not an excuse. But if we could understand so we could actually change it so it isn't that same consequence with that same student. So one of the things would be choices um, and uh, appropriate, appropriate control. You're still in charge. You're, the parent's still in charge. You're the teacher still in charge. I think sometimes, what if it would have been if I said to the kid, hey, do you want a granola bar before you start your Chromebook class or do you, before you get on your Chromebook or do you want to just get started on your Chromebook? Then it's offering that kid a choice. I'm still going to get him to give me a Chromebook. I'm still going to get him to do that class because I'm going to work my butt off to connect with him. But, you know, let him have a choice. Um, do you want an apple or an orange? And if I don't have the apple or orange in my hand, sometimes people, I'm a visual person, I'm a visual learner, so sometimes just seeing that there are two choices. Do you want an apple or an orange? Um, you, and with my uh, little guy that I had, do you want to read one book before bed or two? You're going to bed. But would you know? So, and I started doing it with him, and he was three, and I thought, wow, okay, this actually works. Um, and um, it's you know, and you just gotta, you just gotta keep trying, just keep trying. It's that whole investigate, it's whole being the, the regulator in the room. It's the one thinking about, thinking, being mindful to decide what does this child need and offer some choices so they can be in control of. You're yeah, still getting the result. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to ask. Why do you guys think choices would work? Yeah. Well, they think they're in control. Yeah, you right. Yeah. <laughs> it gives them voice. Yeah. Right? Power. Which builds? Child safety. Right. And it makes them accountable for the choice. So when they decide to do something wrong, they deal with the consequence. But if they do something right, and over time they start learning better more, do more and right so, things. Like an appropriate thing, an, an inappropriate thing would be like, you're gonna want, you want to get out of your Chromebook or you want to go to the office? Yeah. Like that, it's not a choice. I'm not getting compliance, right? And that's not really a choice. Like, you, you, you want to go to bed or get spanked? You know, whatever it is you're doing at home or, no, it's, it's, I really, it would be like, I really want to see you walk across the stage. You're so special. Can you, can you want to give me a few minutes before you go connect with them? How about a word? Whatever, whatever it is you have, a peppermint. I mean, it's something like that. I've connected, I've given them a choice, I'm empowering them a little bit, and, and they can get working. Because I need the train to move. I want y'all want to see them walk across the stage, right? And, you, and it starts when they're young, but it doesn't end when they're in high school either. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's just it. You want, we want to keep the train moving, right? And when we end up with ultimatums, and it doesn't mean that, that the rules aren't there, right? The structure's there. We know what right and wrong is. It's how we're getting there, right? Um, Dr. Karen Purvis, who's the founder of Karen Purvis Institute, used to say, um, you don't need to bring an elephant gun to a gnat, okay? Um, and again, being a, a no mom, being a, somebody that was all about control, right? I would go there really quick. Like I would go there really quick with a consequence versus understanding how to keep the train moving, getting what I want still, getting what I need, but doing it in a way that didn't destroy my relationship with my kid, right? That didn't make me this authoritarian. I'm still authoritative because I'm the adult. I'm the one in charge. It's my power to share. But how I get there, how I keep the train moving as opposed to knocking it right off the tracks is the difference. That's the difference, okay? So and let's say you've it. offered a choice. Oh, this isn't another day. I do want to say this too because I feel like when you're in the classroom and when you are a parent and when you're a volunteer that you're just getting told another thing to do. This isn't another thing to do. This is just another way to do what you're already doing. And how can I make it? How can I make it easier on me so I stay regulated and I can keep the train moving in my classroom or in my home or in the daycare at church or wherever it is that you're that you're spending your time? That is just it's another way to do it, not another thing to do. So I want to make that clear. But um, are we doing compromises? Yeah. Okay. So um, and again, this is all about teaching children and people how to negotiate their needs and. How can I get my needs met in a healthy way? And if we don't ever teach children that, if we haven't modeled it in the classroom or in the community or at home, then they, they have no idea how to get their needs met in a healthy way. So the choices was a good thing. And if they don't want the apple orange, then you can say, well, do you, how about a compromise? And then again, it's putting it on their plate. What, and then they get to be empowered and think, oh, my voice matters. I can think of a compromise, and you can teach them the art of compromise. Now, the compromise not, might not be a Snickers. You know, like if they say, well, I want a Snickers. Well, how about, can you think of something that would be a little bit healthier? Apple orange, think of a compromise that would be, you know, kind of, because the whole time that you're doing this with a child is you're connecting. It's all about connecting and being in a relationship. So you're building this relationship, and probably in the end getting what you want and so is the child, right? And the person. Um, words, you know, social. It, the same with the same with social skills. Um, we wanna we wanna be able to teach the child how to negotiate their needs with each other. So when we're doing it in a healthy way with them, then they can do it with their peers in a healthier way. Mm -hmm. um, what else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Words have power, right? And we want to teach our kids to use their words, right? We're gonna see less physical aggression, we're going to see less acting out when we've taught kids how to use their words well. But they have to learn how to do that, right? You have to learn how to negotiate your needs in a healthy way. And so in order to be a securely attached person, right, if, if we were to do this training and like go deeper into the connecting, we'd be talking about different attachment styles. And different attachment styles are actually formed in that first year of life, right? Um, mine so happened to have been dismissive, which is the, let's go. Rub some dirt on it, okay? Um, there could be some others in the room who also share the same <laughs> attachment style. It's fine, we're all okay. Um, and in some areas of our lives, it can be very, very effective. In business, it's fantastic, right? Because we keep the train moving, right? Um, on our terms. But we wanna be able to keep the train moving in relational terms because we're dealing with people, not processes here. We're not dealing with a widget. We're dealing with a human being. Right? Made in the image of God, just like me. And so I have to see that in each person that I'm dealing with, big or small. Made in the image of God, just like me. If I'm not valuing that in them, then I've stripped their dignity. And when I've stripped their dignity, now I've, again, it becomes this authoritarian as opposed to authoritative. Being seen and heard and valued. That's right. That's right. And so... The whole point behind choices and compromises is to keep the train moving and to be able to teach these skills of using your words well 
and learning how to think through what you need and negotiate those needs in a healthy way before it becomes behavioral. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, being a securely attached adult means that I have the ability to give care, receive care, negotiate my needs in a healthy way, and be comfortable with who I am apart from others. Okay? That is always the goal. That is always the goal. If I can't give care to someone else, if I don't have empathy to share with someone else, that's a problem. If I can't receive care, right, because of whatever my history is, that's a problem. If I lash out instead of using my words to negotiate what my needs are, that's a problem. And if I don't know who I am, if I am lost because of the messages that are coming at me or because my history tells me something, that is a problem. Okay? So the whole goal with TBRI is to get us to a place where we can do those four things securely and successfully. Um, as the adult in the room, I am the adult in the room. <laughs> I have the power. It's my power to share, whether I'm um, a parent or a caregiver of little people or big people or the teacher in the room. I'm still in charge. And with that comes responsibility. With that comes responsibility. And when I share my power, okay, it says to the other person that safe people listen to me. My voice matters. Doesn't mean I have to agree with them, but I can listen and I can ask questions and I can walk alongside. Okay? And then I can use some of my other tools to redirect in the way the train needs to keep moving. When we are, so what we were just talking about choices, compromises, and sharing power, those are what we call proactive strategies. And these are on page 18. Um, of your guide, if you're following along in the guide. And there's one more handout that goes along with these proactive strategies. Uh, it's in the front pocket of your uh, yep. oh, we got it. <laughs> um, called life value terms. And they're short little phrases, okay? They're short little phrases that can be used in a really playful way, because remember, play disarms fear, right? And um, especially with older kids, whoa, are you asking or telling? Give me that, miss. Whoa, are you asking or telling? You will be shocked at how quickly a kid says, oh, uh, could I please have whatever, right? Uh, let's try that again with respect. I can't wait to answer your question when you try it again with respect, <laughs> okay? And again, these are ways we're still getting what we want. So I could come back at that kid and say, you're not gonna talk to me that way. I'm not gonna get the same response when I do that that I do when I come back with some playful engagement and keep the train moving and, get, and still get what I want, right? So these are just, this is a little, little tip sheet that could be really handy. This lives on my refrigerator. Um, um, yeah, <coughs> Aster and Helen is a huge one, especially with teenagers. I don't know if you have any, they're a good time. <laughs> um, so those are our proactive strategies. Those are our proactive strategies. These are things we're teaching. These are skills that we're like putting into place, right? These kind of come out of empowering into the proactive. But sometimes we've got to respond. And so we're going to look now at our two responsive strategies. And so we start with something we call the ideal response. And it's an acronym, okay? So when I'm dealing with a behavior situation, I want to deal with it immediately. It is not... Well, wait till the principal comes in, or wait till dad gets home, okay? I'm dealing with the situation in the moment, and it'd be indirect. Coming in, I'm right here with you, okay? Notice I went out of the left. Because if I'm coming in at you like this, all of a sudden your body's gonna feel different things, right? So I'm coming in out of the left, we're right here, me and you, right? I'm gonna be efficient. I'm gonna be efficient with my words, right? Because again, I don't need to take an elephant gun to a gnat. It's not going to work and it's going to cause collateral damage. Right? If I freak out in that moment, it's over. Right? Or it's game on. And nobody wants that. <laughs> nobody wants that. Um, 
We're going to be action-based in the way that we respond. What fires together, wires together in the brain. So if a kid's just done something wrong, I want them to do what's right. Let's try that again with respect. Okay. Are you asking or telling? That's what we call a redo. We want them to practice doing it the right way. Because when they practice doing it the right way, that gets set in their brain, and the next time a situation comes up, it can be recalled. If I'm just punishing what they did because I didn't like it, and they're not doing it the right way, there's no recall. Their recall is, is what's coming at them. What's coming at them is not going to change their behavior. It is just punishing it. It's not changing it. We have to be able to practice doing it the right way because what fires together wires together in our brain. That's why it's so important in regulated time to practice all these skills that we've been talking about today. Okay? We have to practice doing it right. So when the rubber meets the road, we have the recall to be able to do it right. That's why as an adult, I'm still learning how to not be dismissive and how to stop when my kid says they hurt, even if I don't see blood, and acknowledge that it matters. Okay? I have to be mindful enough to do that. Finally, so we've been immediate, we're doing it right then, we're at or below, we're efficient with our words, right? Because if they're triggered, you only got two or three anyway. <laughs> we're um, we're action-based, we're doing the redo, and here's the big one. And I'll tell you, this is really big in our school. Leveled at the behavior and not the child. I said before that we approach this understanding that we are all made in the image of God, which means that I am precious. I was created on purpose for a purpose. Okay? When we look at a behavior and then we assault the character of the child, just because what that kid did was bad, the action was not okay. It was not permissible. It does they not. They lied, but they're not liars. That's right. You know? Okay, they made a mistake, but that doesn't mean they're doomed. You know, so that's very important, and it's hard. I know it's hard. I know it's hard when you're a teacher and, it, and you're in the classroom or when you're dealing with people, and you know they're not being truthful, and they're not being truthful over and over and over again. But I, you have to kind of, that's where the mindful piece comes, where they, they lied. They weren't telling the truth, but they're not liars. Children become who we tell them they are. Children become who we tell them they are. If a child has been told since the time they entered kindergarten that they're not smart, that they can't do the work, that they're bad, it's who they believe they are. We have to choose our words very wisely, especially when we're responding to behavior. Because what is the need behind that behavior? The behavior is a symptom. And we want it to change. We want it to go away. That is okay. There is nothing wrong with that. That's acceptable and necessary. But we have to ask the question of what is the need behind that behavior so that we can address it appropriately so we can see those behaviors go away. If we just try, keep trying to get compliance, playing whack-a-mole with those, it's never going to be resolved. And here's the deal. The kids that come up through our school system are not leaving our community. They're not going away. We can't expel it out of our schools. They're going to have kids, and their kids are going to enter the school system. And because it was never healed in that generation, it's going to carry forward. We just saw the science behind it when we started today, right? We know that it's real. So we have to approach it differently because it can be different. So when we respond, we've got to focus on the behavior. The lying's not okay. But if all of a sudden I'm calling you a liar, that's an assault on your character. And so well, now I'm a liar. No, you lied. That's not okay. Now we're going to tell the truth. We're going to practice doing what's right. We have to be really careful with that. Because especially as kids are coming up through elementary and over into middle and high, they have been given a lot of messages about who they are. And they're getting even more messages, rapid fire, through social media and through other avenues that are coming at them very quickly. Kids want to understand who am I? What is my purpose here? So as the safe adults in the room, 
we really have to be wise in the words we give them so that they can understand themselves. We did this already, play for engagement. Not really. I mean, this is the second, this is the, this is the final um, uh, responsive strategy is the levels of response. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we start, so there's four levels of response in TBRI, and it starts out as play, uh, playful engagement, which is what Marissa was talking about earlier when the kid uh, or the person is doing something. Obviously, you would be doing this more with kids. Um, would you like to try that again with respect? Are you asking or telling? Sometimes with little kids, um, you know, I'd be like, oh, my ears can't hear such words. Can you try? Can you sing something nice? And, and laugh and smile and be playful. And that's that's level one. That means that not the, the, the children or the child is not here yet, right? But we can tell that it, they might be getting, like, here. So we might be able to quick get them back, right? So level one is playful. Level two is what they call structured engagement. So that's where you would um, get on the child's level, get more like what she was saying, be more direct. You know that you're, this is going to require a big response. You still want to get back to playfulness because play disarms fear, and that's where we like to um, be. We always want to get back to playfulness, which makes us feel safe, too. Um, so we would use maybe more of a structured voice. That's where the choices come in. Um, and then, at, you know, Redo, there's a, there's a book called Redo Rue, and it's about little King Rue. We did this with our preschoolers and our little kids. But it's really just about them learning that they get a redo. Like how many times I think, I feel like as an adult, um, I, I wish I could have a redo, right? And so if we teach kids when they're young, and I will say this, when, like, obviously this isn't always going to, um, we're not always going to be able to be mindful and with it and stuff like that, but... Um, so when you do rupture, um, when you do do the thing that you wish you hadn't done, when you do say to the kid, just sit down for now, like, and then you're like, oh, that is a child I know is from a hard place, and that they did that voice triggered there, and you know, you know all the things, you know all the things, and most of our teachers do know all the things, but when you do do the thing that you wish you hadn't have done, there's nothing more powerful than than going to the child when you feel like doing it, when you can have nice eyes. And repair it because when you repair something when you say hey I didn't handle that the best way and I'm really sorry I want you to feel seen and heard I care about you when you look at them and do that that's where the relationship happens and I think sometimes we miss that um, that that piece that repair so we rupture things but we don't always don't get the option to repair and, and I would encourage all of us to fight for the repair time because that's where the relationship really happens yeah yeah, without a doubt, especially as a recovering dismissive. Um, <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many times I've had to go back to my spouse, to Amber Lee, to uh, my kids, and say, wow, that, I didn't handle that the way that I wanted to. I know it didn't, certainly didn't make you feel safe, and I don't feel good about it either. Um, can I have a redo? Like, when we, as the grown-ups in the room, are able to admit when we've done something wrong, it gives them the safety and the space to be okay with saying, ooh, I didn't handle that right either, right? And, and to ask to try again. Like, the rupture is gonna happen. It happens all the time. But the repair is everything. Um, when we get to the third level of um, response, it's called calming engagement. This is where behavior um, has escalated and where they're gonna need some co-regulation. And so in TBRI, we talk about time in as opposed to time out. Every time we send a kid away, whether we send them to their room or we send them to the dean or we send them away from you, what message does that send to them? Can't stand to be around you. Get out of my face. Go away. That is not seen, heard, or valued. Okay? Now, sometimes when we get to level four, safety comes into play, so that's a whole other story. But when we're talking about time in, it's about coming up to the kid who has about pushed your last button and getting here with them. Okay? Um, when we just constantly send away or we send kids to their room, we are, um, and this isn't, this isn't easy, right? Again, this is not something that I grew up understanding at all. When we talk about time in, it's about pulling them in close. So at home, what it looks like is instead of sending off to a room is a, a, a specific chair in the open space of our house to go calm down. Because this is about calming engagement. Somebody has flipped their lid here. 
and we're trying to get back to a place of calm, okay? So time in with an adult or a quiet space is really important. Um, re the redo, once, you're, once the child's able to do it, because again, if they're completely dysregulated, we gotta get back here in order to practice doing it right. Um, but instead of being quick to send away, we wanna try pulling in, because again, we wanna keep the train on the tracks. And often our kids who are struggling the most are kids who have had way more disruption in their lives than is good for them. They need the instructional time. They need, they need to be in a place of regulation, but they've got to acquire the skills. We've got to help them with the skills to get there. Too often we just go to level four. Too often we just go to level four. Um, because we haven't done the other things, we see the aggression, we see the violence, right? We see the behavior that's like super ugly. Um, obviously, when there's a safety threat to others, we have to take steps to mitigate that. But again, we always want to like deal with that in the moment and get back, like work ourselves down to level three, to level two, back to level one, because we want them to be able to be fully integrated into our community, not just into the classroom. The kids that we're raising are becoming the adults of tomorrow who will have children who will also enter our school system, right? That's, that's the reality. So, and just, we're gonna wrap up here. I know we wanna be mindful of your time, but when it's over, it's over. And that's one of the things that I think is kind of hard to do when you're, especially in the classroom. And then just with experiences with people, if you're used to somebody, um, always doing something, but you've taken care of it, you've repaired it or whatever, it's never helpful to say, um, well, I sure hope they don't act like they did yesterday. <laughs> you know, like, and I don't, I always say, we do always say this at um, trainings, like, I don't think any of us wake up and say, gosh, I hope we, hope we ruin Tommy's life today, because it'll be super fun if we get Tommy to the office, you know, that's what my goal is today. So that's never our goal. Uh, we want everybody to be healthy, be able to thrive, be able to learn. We want the teachers to feel safe so they can they can do all the things that they need to do um, and, and, and feel supported. So we need, I know we need to love them well and to do a good job there. Yeah. yeah, we have to take care of the adults before the adults can take care of the kids. That's the reality. And so as we're thinking about this, um, the, the need for adults to have felt safety in the spaces that they're in, right? Just getting, getting a paycheck isn't enough for that. Like, they've got to feel seen, heard, and valued as well. Um, having healthy connection, having healthy connection with peers, having healthy connection throughout their lives, and having the ability to self-regulate. And that self-regulation really comes through mindfulness, right? It doesn't mean that it's easy, right? Our histories don't necessarily make things easy, but when we understand them and we can be honest about them, we can deal with them. And so, um, how do these three pillars connect with TBRI? Well, this is where we see it, right here. Um, through connecting, our, the attachment system that we were talking about, right? Need expressed, need met, that ties into felt safety. Um, with empowering, we're providing structure and predictability. When we were talking about the wisdom of the body and the wisdom of spaces. With correcting, it's structured interaction, right? We have a way to get there. It doesn't have to be the elephant gun with a gnat every time. Um, in creating connection, well, obviously, connect, connecting is gonna create connection, right? Empowering is meeting those needs physiologically in the environment. Um, with correcting, when we give voice in the correcting process, it builds that connection. The behavior's not okay, the behavior has to change. But how we get there is what makes all the difference. And helping people be able to move into a place of self-regulation, well, when we're connecting, we can be attuned attuned to what's going on. We have to be sensitive to it, which means I've gotta be okay myself first, right? Um, empowering brings the guided self-regulation. It's the co-regulation, it's the walking alongside with. It does not end when a kid moves to middle school at all. It just looks different. Co-regulation looks different then. We go from being more instructional to much more of a coach. And then finally, um, teaching kids how to get there. Kids who are exploding don't have other tools. If they had other tools that they had ready access to, they wouldn't be exploding. Nobody wants to be sent away. None of us want to feel that way. 
Thank you guys so much. We would love to answer any questions. I know that we are at time, but um, we're so grateful for the opportunity to share with you guys um, what we're part of. Thank you so much, ladies. Uh, this is great work, and it's exciting that uh, you have some things for us to think about with all the many students that we're dealing with every day and interacting with every day and trying to build relationships with every day. So some of these strategies and tools, I think, will be very, very helpful as we just continue to dive deeper. I'd love to hear more about the other trainings that you do because mm -hmm. this just is the icing on the cake. But I'm sure as we peel that onion and really get deeper and deeper in the work that we as educators will become more skilled on how to work with the kids because there's so many opportunities for us to make a difference with those kids. And not just kids, for all of us too, right? Yeah, right. All of us as well. Yeah, so. I think you start with parents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Can you yeah. share with how many schools you've gone into for, with, with this for professional development? So far, only one. Just one. Just mm -hmm. Avon Park Middle. Okay. Yep, yeah, Avon Park Middle welcomed us in. I was thinking she had more than one, too. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was thinking there was some work out at Hill Gust up. And then, you know, no, not, okay. not yet. Okay, good. And yeah. I'm just no. wondering, too, what do we offer? Um, I mean, I know. To our, to our new teachers, some of those professional developments and things starting out. Um, but, you know, I kind of see this as like the relational piece to classroom management, you know, so when you're going through school, and maybe things have changed now since I was in college, um, but, you know, you get all of your procedures, so I can, you know, I know that I'm supposed to teach my kids how to properly come to the rug, and if they don't do it right, then we go back and we try again, or, Middle school, you know, when you walk in, what is expected of you as soon as you walk into my classroom, changing classes, all those types of things. But for this, this is that relational piece. I can teach you the structure, but how, how are we supporting our teachers in supporting our kids for the relational piece? And how fitting is it that we're having our code of conduct workshop, you know, this afternoon? Um, because if we're not dressing, addressing things this way, your consequences, you know, we can lay down the iron fist as much as we want, but are we getting a different result? So I think that's um, what they say about um, insanity. That's what I was thinking. Same thing over yes. and over. So doing the same, same, same code of conduct for years and years yep, and years, yep. and it hasn't necessarily, the data right. doesn't show that it's worked. Right. And, so. and some teachers just naturally are able to have build that relational piece mm -hmm. and they understand that. And some teachers don't and they do need the support. And so how are we helping our teachers to make sure that, you know, what what they are able to deal with in the classroom, we're giving them all the tools mm -hmm. to successfully <laughs> help our, our kids. Yeah. Definitely. I and mean, I'm so glad that is I there an interest for, do our schools, has there been an interest for our schools with oh, this? Yeah. It's just me. Especially with their new yeah. teachers and all that. Yeah. The big thing that I liked about this was it takes us back to that teacher has to develop that connection and relationship. That dean can punish, that principal can punish, that code of conduct can punish. The rules can punish. The expectations can punish. But that, that teacher still has to go in, back into that classroom and live with that group of individuals. If they can't connect, then there's, there's no there's no way it's going to work. Well, it was really, um, I think, about this whole idea. And I appreciate um, Marissa for being very brave and courageous mm -hmm. and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. and, that, and maybe some of you all have experienced in just today, that this is really paradigm shift mm -hmm. in thinking mm -hmm. for some individual, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And so it's not, like you said, Nicole, some teachers at their nature, and they would, but some people actually feel like it would be against what they believe to be thinking about this in a different way. Mm -hmm. so it has mm -hmm. to be done in a way that people are able to be vulnerable mm -hmm. and to do self-reflection and to do that 
one of the reasons we started with our school counselors. Mm -hmm. In most of our situations, the school counselors are a very trusted pers person on those campuses, right? Mm -hmm. And so teachers and staff go to them to help understand. They believe in those people. They have trust in those people. They value the input and the talking through some of those pieces of it. But it really does take um, a person to be courageous, to think about that this is shifting my thinking a little bit, um, my beliefs a little bit, and experiencing some bumps along the way that it won't be perfect every time. <laughs> but the science is there. And not only is the science is there, but the real life kids are there. And it's happening every day with kids and with teachers when you make those relations and those connections. And I do think there is the, um, the opportunity to expand it and to just let people go really um, at a pace in which they feel a comfort, mm -hmm. a comfort at making that shift and moving that forward in those pieces. And my experience has been when they experience that and they feel that, then they don't, when you know, it's my Angela, when you know better, you do better, right? right? right. When you understand mm -hmm. that, you mm -hmm. move forward with those pieces of it. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, I do think there's an opportunity, and I do want to say again, I appreciate Marissa's mm -hmm. courageousness of saying that, because yeah. I think, I mean, I probably was there as a mom too at some point, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Many of us probably were there at some place, mm -hmm. and being able to open and understand and um be uh, willing to be courageous to a, maybe a different way of thinking and approach um, with it um, is really important for really buy-in for people. It can't be everybody has to go to this new training. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. as wonderful as we think oh, it yep. is. It cannot be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's just recognizing the need yeah. and really just thinking differently, as you're <coughs> saying. I mean, last year we, we hired 125 new teachers. Mm -hmm. This year we've hired 118 to this point. And so as I think about not only our new staff, but our more veteran staff, I mean, even I've been in education for 32 years. I learned things today to think about not only just with the teaching, but my own family, mm -hmm. you know, and how you interact with one another. And I don't know, it's very, very powerful, ladies. And mm -hmm. it is uncharted water. And um, I think it will And I had to met be. with Marissa and Amberly prior to this, but and which where we're at our conferences in Tampa, of course, is across the state of Florida. It's how to reach the children that they're talking about and how to reach the children's parents. Mm -hmm. And so you've got some things in mind possibly there also, I mean, through churches, I mean. Well, and so another, another um, thing that I kind of, just from working in the office at Seaman High School, and I told Marissa this, I wish so bad that we would think about our office staff because um, yeah. Yeah. they're yeah. sort they're of the first. heartbeat. They're the first thing yeah. that parents see or yeah. caregivers see. And so when they come in furious or when they come in because you've called again, you know, it, it seemed like over and over again it would be often be a lot of the same parents. So they come in mm -hmm. mad, you know, mm -hmm. kind of fuzzy, you know, they come in mad. If we could give the front desk, no, I mean, and I, it's true, right? Like. I have, coming in from their own history. Right? I have like, called yeah. um, before knowing a parent was going to come in and getting up to the front desk as soon as I could because I didn't want them to start yelling at the, the our front desk, our receptionist, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and if but if they could, if we could even empower them to start looking at these people through the lens of what happened to you and and start the con because what happens is they're fired up if this person on the other side of the desk can't get them to a place of regulation, then we buzz them through to the guidance, and then they're screaming at the guidance clerk, and then, you know, it's a trickle down effect, you know, mm -hmm. but so really, some of the people that our parents always see never get trainings like this, and um, it, it just, in, in like, um, I know the mentor program, you know, there, I, I have some friends, some friends that I, we've trained at churches and things, and they're like, how could we plug in, how could, now that we understand, mm -hmm. how can we plug in? And I say, call John Spencer, there's his number, you know, if you can be consistent with this, with the child, but if we can start training our community members to just be a consistent person in a child's life once a week or once every two weeks, whatever that looks like to you, um, but we train you so you are equipped when you're sitting across from a student that 
you know, is saying, because so many times we've connected a student with a child and the, the I mean, a, an adult with a, child, a student and they're like, I don't know, I got another kid. And the last thing we want to do is throw a, that, a kid that we recognize as maybe needing to have lunch with an adult to another adult, you know what I mean? But it's really all about not knowing. It's not, we have this amazing community. I know, and we have people who are willing to put in their time and their, their, their efforts. They just need to know, they just need to be equipped, mm -hmm. you know? Because yeah. when you know how to do it, mm -hmm. you, you can do it better. And the training that Amberly came to that I was doing previously, which was a deeper dive into TBRI, and we did have quite a few teachers, actually several teachers from LPE especially, that attended. And um, I just wanted to share with you guys, I got some feedback from um, uh, one of them who was teaching second grade, and she said, the thing that you're going to hear is it's just one more thing. Mm -hmm. It's just one more thing. And her exact words were, here's why it's not. Mm -hmm. She said, it's here to help you see things in a different way which is what we've been talking about today, right? It doesn't require you additional prep time. It's to help us be with each other and it's applicable across your life, not just for the classroom. It's understanding that behavior is not all defiance and that it's practical when we're dealing with behaviors that can be exhausting and don't make sense in the moment. Mm -hmm. So that was, from, that was from a teacher in our district yeah. Yeah. Um, who went through it. And, and she decided to come to the class because she had, she had a, a kiddo that got moved into her room who was super challenging and super disrupting. And, um, and she didn't know how to help him. She wanted to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I just, I don't want it to be one more thing. Teachers don't need one more thing on their plate. I actually, you know, would want it to be something that removes things from their plate. Because at the end of the day, we want our kids in our classroom. We don't want disruptions. We want our kids to learn. We, that's what we want. And so if we have the structure and the expectation along with the relational piece, then we're all winning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and obviously they have to want to do it. But I certainly want us to give our teachers all the options and tools mm -hmm. to be as successful as they can in their, you and know, because exactly they're in it day to day. That's exactly why we want to work with the adults, right? We want to work with the parents. We want to work with the churches. We want to work. We're not doing direct service to kids. That's not what we're doing. We're working with the grown-ups who are, who are taking care of the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank, Thank you guys very much you. for your time. I do, before we adjourn, I just want to send a note uh, Marlene had shared with us that I want to send our condolences to the Colthorpe family. Um, which was John McClure's sister, Sarah, has, uh, as, as he put it very, Sarah went home to our Lord. And, uh, and I even had a friend that had kind of, we'd done an angel emoji, and Sarah was always an angel. She really was. And so, and she was a family member of our education system, so our, fam our condolences to her and, and to all of her family. All the support shop is your And you guys... Amberly's passing out. If you could just scan the feedback QR code for us, um, that would be great. And Is that different than this one? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yep, she's passing it up. I'll take the, the base one.